Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 7th, 2021 school board regular meeting. It is now 6 p.m. Uh, I would like to uh, call to order and land acknowledgement statement. The school board would like to take this moment to respectfully acknowledge we are residing on the traditional land of the Diné people. Our mission statement our mission is to provide an excellent, equitable education in a safe, supportive environment so all students will succeed and contribute to a diverse and changing society. We will start with our Pledge of Allegiance, led by me. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Tuttle, can we get the roll call? Mr. Rhodes. Here. Thank you. Colonel Williamson by Zoom. Here. Thank you. Colonel Siri by Zoom. I don't see him on yet. He is expected. Mr. Sampson is expected. Mrs. Matheson. Here. Thank you. Mr. Doran. Here. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson. Here. Thank you. Ms. Marotti. Here. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. Here. Thank you. Mrs. Luke. Here. Thank you. The board has a quorum. Thank you, Mrs. Tuttle. Um, just as a reminder, we do have a current um, mask uh, requirement, and if you would like one, they are located in the back. Thank you. Um, we, our first order of business is to acknowledge the 2021 ASAA First National Bank Alaska Swim and Dive State Champions. Core value. Maintain high expectations and educational opportunities to inspire high achievement. District students won four state champion title, championship titles at the recent 2021 ASAA First National Bank Alaska Swim and Dive State Championships. Additionally, the Lathrop High School girls swim team received the ASAA State Cha uh, Sportsmanships Award and the West Valley High School boys swim team received the ASAA State Academic Award for the boys' highest combined GPA point average. The teams were coached by Chris Hagland, West Valley High School head swim coach, and Kate Matthews. Lathrop and Hutchison High School head swim coach accompanied by West Valley assistant coaches, Tony Hawkins and Sam Wudig. Coach Hadlig, hmm, Hagland, assisted by Coach Hawkins and Clarence Mingo, 
Lathrop High School assistant principal will make the presentation. Please come to the podium. Thank you, Superintendent Moline and school board members for taking the time to recognize these fine athletes this evening. First off, I would like to recognize individual medalist Avery Halfley, who, unlike the Olympic gold medalist Lydia Jacoby, that finished third her sophomore year at State, brought home not only one, but two state titles her sophomore year at State. <clears throat> As a sophomore in the 100-yard backstroke and the 100-yard butterfly. Congratulations to you, Avery. We all understand and know that wasn't a small feat and you deserve this moment. Avery. Okay. Next up, I would like to commend four young ladies on their representation of not only Lathrop High School community, but also the community of Fairbanks at the state level. Thank you to their parents for instilling in these young ladies the importance of character and how it not only defines you, but can allow you to be recognized by it as well. Congratulations to Elizabeth Bailey, Avery Halfley, Natalie Napolili, and Timberlyn Wint for their achievement as recipients of the State Championship Sportsmanship Award. All right, we'll go ahead and carry on here. Hello, I'm Chris Heigland, head coach for the West Valley swim team. And next to me is Samantha Wudig, our assistant coach. Um, congratulations to all the swimmers in our region. It was great to see them do so well and represent our region so well at the state meet, which was hosted in Anchorage at Bartlett this year. Um, as a coach, we were exceptionally proud of West Valley High School, uh, the whole team this year. The work they put in the season, the team spirit, all the laughs, and their resulting accomplish accomplishments were heartwarming to see. I think coming out of a year where we didn't really get to have a season, it took everyone a while to find their equilibrium and remember how it all worked, us included. Um, we, Coach Sam and myself, look forward to our next season with these scholar athletes as well. The West Valley girls team was runner up, so second place at state, which was an accomplishment. Um, Samantha Brister, if she would like to come on up. One of our West Valley girls team members helped to get the team there with her first place finish in the 500 freestyle. She was also an integral part of the girls relays and uh, did podium in her other event as well. Congratulations on your achievements. Um, the nice thing is she's only a junior as well, so we're looking forward to having her back next year. Okay, the West Valley High School Boys State Team was the recipient to the Academic High Point Award. Out of all the teams in the state, they have the highest GPA. So as one of our swimmers said, they're the smartest guys on the swim deck. Congratulations to these scholar athletes because that's really what it's all about. They not only made state, they swam and dove incredibly well there, but are recognized as outstanding scholars as well. So congratulations to Ashton Banks, Selwyn Wessel, Henry Rapaski, Ezra Mayo, Kyan Harnum, River Quayle, Ryder Marshall, Eli West, and Ezra West for their accomplishments.
Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Clarice here again to talk about Grace Green, one of our divers down at State. All right, well, it just wouldn't be complete if we didn't recognize one of our own from Hutchinson High School, Grace Green, for her first place in girls diving at this year's state championship. So congratulations to you, Grace. Thank you for representing the Hawks. Congratulations again. That academic achievement is quite impressive. Our next item is the ESP of the month, core value. Maintain high expectations and educational opportunities to inspire high achievement. Tina Lammers, Tikasek Brown Elementary School Library Associate, uh, will be recognized as the ESP of the month for December 2021. Catherine Push? Tikasek Brown Elementary School principal will make the presentation. Okay, let me start again. <laughs> and I'm really short, sorry guys. Okay, so I'm super excited to be here and get to present this award to Tina, who's been at Tukasik for the last eight years. Um, she is outstanding in her position as a library aide or associate and um, goes above and beyond what really she, what her job duties are. She does an amazing job with technology. We're a one-to-one -one school like everyone else's. Um, so she's in charge of all of that, which is a lot. Um, she also does fantastic lessons with our kids uh, that tie with our teachers. She really goes ab above what's expected and works with teachers, steps out of her way to make sure that things tie together and make, make uh, great connections for kids. Um, I asked her why she does so much extra and she said, I enjoy doing things for our community and showing students how we can make a difference in their lives. This year as a community project, I hosted a sock drive and the students raised 2,430 pairs of socks and that were donated to the Fairbanks Rescue Mission. If you've ever seen third graders move 2,000 pairs of socks, um, it was quite an, uh, an undertaking. Um, I w uh, she says, I was very proud of all of them. I enjoyed doing and I enjoy doing Richmond activities with kids and love collaborating with teachers um, and piggy, piggybacking on what they are teaching. I enjoy being a team player. Her life's motto is it never hurts to just listen. Sometimes that's all someone needs, no matter how young or old, is to just listen. She would like to also recognize her family and says, My family is my life. I live with my very supportive husband, Brett. We have seven uh, children ranging in age from 24 to five years old. This year, we have two seniors, one sophomore, one freshman, one eighth grader, a kindergartner, and a 24-year-old who just got married. With uh, having all of them, I have learned to just listen. Tina is fantastic, and I'm so happy to be able to honor her tonight. Congratulations. Thank you again. A 
adoption of the agenda. Core value, center everything we do on the student and student learning. Consent agenda items marked with an asterisk are considered routine items not requiring public discussion by the school board. Unless removed from the consent agenda, uh, asterisk items will be automatically approved when the agenda is adopted. Questions concerning these items should be directed to the administration before the meeting. If the chief school administrator or a member of the public wishes to have an item removed from the consent agenda, the request must be made to a board member any time prior to the start of the meeting. The board member has the direction to accept or deny the request. Only a board member may remove an item from the consent agenda. If an item is removed from the consent agenda, it shall be considered separately as the last item of new business. Asterisk items will then be adopted by one single motion. Can I get a motion? Move to adopt the agenda with consent items. Second. Can I get a vote? Colonel Williamson. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marotti. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke. Yes. Thank you. The motion carried. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Toro, can we get a presentation of the agenda items, please? The board has accepted the following grant awards, $633,149.63 for the Alaska Comprehensive Literacy State Development Program grant from the United States Department of Education through the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development for Fiscal Note 2022-26. $80,423 for the American Rescue Plan, Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund Homeless Children and Youth One Grant from the United States Department of Education through the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development for Fiscal Note 2022-29 and $90,025 for the Title I Part, Do, two, Part D, Subpart 2, Neglected and Delinquent Competitive Grant from the United States Department of Education through the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development per Fiscal Note 2022-30. The Board has approved Kickasick Brown Elementary School's request to accept $1,400 raised through a trunk or treat family event school fundraiser held October 29, 2021, with the proceeds to be used to fund teacher club accounts and to assist with purchasing classroom supplies and funding other classroom needs. They've also accepted Tickasook Brown Elementary School's request for accepting $1,600 raised through a Facebook basket auction school fundraiser held November 10th through the 12th, 2021, with the proceeds to be used to fund teacher club accounts and to assist with purchasing supplies and funding other classroom needs. The board has approved the following fundraising requests. Hunter Elementary School's request to fundraise approximately $2,500 through a spring scholastic book fair from February 21st through the 25th, 2022, with proceeds to be used for the purchase of library books and supplies. Weller Elementary School's request to fundraise approximately $2,500 through the American Heart Challenge from January 10th through the 31st, 2022, with proceeds to be used for the purchase of physical education equipment. And Ben Ileson Junior Senior High School's request to fundraise approximately $1,500 through t-shirt sales to be used to purchase new jerseys and gear for the boys basketball program. The board has approved the following fundraising travel or travel requests. Lathrop High School's request to send 24 ballroom dance students and six chaperones to Phoenix, Sholo, and Pine Top, Arizona, March 18th through the 23rd, 2022, to perform at area schools, participating in the dance exchange groups at no cost to the district. And if any state or federal travel or health warnings are issued, students will not travel. West Valley High School's request to send five Marine Corps JROTC rifle team students and one staff member to Chandler, Arizona, February 1st through the 6th, 2022, 
to compete in a national service championship air rifle match with the district covering one substitute for four days. And if any state or federal travel or health warnings are issued, students will not travel. Cannon Middle School's request to raise approximately $1,850 through concession sales, Great Alaska Pizza Kits, and phone book deliveries to send approximately 10 students, two teachers, and up to three parent chaperones to Washington, D.C., March 11th through the 20th, 2022, to, to participate in the close-up program at no cost to the district. And if any state or federal travel health warnings are issued, students will not travel. And Lathrop High School's request to raise approximately $1,000 through soup sales to help send approximately seven world language students, one teacher, and two parents to Spain, March 11th through the 21st, 2022, to build on their foreign language skills, cultural knowledge, and to learn more about European classical and modern art at no cost to the district. And if any state, federal, or an international travel or health warnings are issued, students will not travel. The board has accepted the following donations, $1,000 from the Isles and Spouses Club to Crawford Elementary School for the purchase of books and seating for the library, $11,724 from the EOSC Welfare Fund to Ben Isleson Junior Senior High School with $1,500 to the senior class to purchase decorations and sweatshirts for graduation, $1,500 to the multicultural program to purchase supplies for student cultural presentations, $2,724 to the school to cover the cost of air rifle supplies, $3,000 to the cross country running team to help cover travel expenses to state, and $3,000 to the cheerleading group for the purchase of mats and practice gear. $1,000 from Doyon Limited to Hutchison High School to support the school's Alaska Native Education Program, $3,534.95 from Wallsworth to Lathrop High School to offset the school's yearbook expenses. $3,100 from R2 Cents Fairbanks Incorporated to North Pole High School to be used to purchase clothing and other supplies for the Patriot Closet. $1,000 from Doyon Limited to West Valley High School to support their Alaska education program. $1,200 from the Sons of the American Legion Squad 57 to West Valley High School to support the school's JROTC program, and $3,400 from the American Legion C. Russell Hubbard Post 57 to West Valley High School to support their school's JROTC program. The board has approved the minutes from the November 16th special meeting and regular meeting as submitted. The personal action report for the period November 5th through the 22nd, 2021, the board has acknowledged the personal information report for the period November 8th through the 22nd, 2021, the budget transfer report for the period November 1st through the 15th, 2021, the board's reading file and the coming events and meeting announcements. Thank you so much, Ms. Tuttle. Next item of business, public comments on reports and non-agenda items. Public comments on reports and non-agenda items, including public input on salaries, benefits, and any other contractual items regarding the Educational Support Staff Association, the Fairbanks Education Association, and the Fairbanks Principal Association negotiations. Our goals, core value, engage with students, family, staff, and community to support student success. Public comments on reports and non-agenda items are limited to two minutes per person for a maximum of one hour. People who have signed up in advance through the school board office to testify in person or by Zoom will be called upon first, and if time remains, anyone else who is in person will be invited to testify until the one hour time limit has been reached. A person testifying shall state their full name, spelling their last name, and their city of residence for the record. Board members may ask questions for clarification. Although there is time at the end of each meeting for school board and superintendent comments, some concerns may not be able to be addressed immediately as additional information may be needed to gather. Public input is welcome on salaries, benefits, and any other contractual items regarding the Education Support Staff Association, the Fairbanks Education Association, and the Fairbanks Principal Association negotiations. Again, as we go through these, this testimony is the 
um, for the non-agenda and non and on reports. Um, for those who have already signed up, we will start with Elizabeth Maiden. Um, and when you come on, if you would state your name and your last name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Miss Maiden, are you online? I don't see her. Okay. Next on the list is Leo Old Mixon. She's last name O L D M I X O N. She was on just a moment. Maybe she dropped off and we'll come back on, but she was on. Oh, here she is. And Lael, if you could give us your first name, spell your last name, give us your area of um, residency, and uh, you will have two minutes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lael Oldmixon, and I live in Fairbanks, Alaska. It is spelled L-A-E-L-O-L-D-M-I-X-O-N. Thank you for the test or opportunity to testify tonight. Um, I am testifying with an invitation to support and identify youth who are positive contributors in our school district and tell them that they are seen, heard, and acknowledged, and most importantly, that they matter. Spirit of Youth is accepting nominations for the annual Spirit of Youth Awards, and Alaska youth ages 12 to 19 are eligible to be nominated. All nominees will receive a certificate and have the opportunity for recognition through the school board in their community. 11 nominees will be honored with the Spirit of Youth Award, which includes a scholarship account that can be used for qualified education expenses anywhere in the country after high school. Nominations don't have to be lengthy essays. The Spirit of Youth Teen Advisory Council just needs to know the name of the youth and what you observed about their positive contributions. So here are a few examples of qualified reasons to nominate someone. They voluntarily helped a neighbor or friend. They took a chance and testified before the school board or borough assembly. They're a young entrepreneur who started their own business. They've demonstrated grit or resiliency, which let's face it, hasn't every kid done that today? Uh, they volunteer in the community. They're good role models for others. They put themselves out there at a science fair or in another innovative activity. Um, no matter the size or the scope of the action, acknowledging the positive actions that you've witnessed can be life altering. It can shape confidence and show youth their value and potential. So I just encourage all to consider nominating a youth and it's a great way to say, I see you and you matter. For more information, you can visit spiritofyouth.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you so much. Next, we have Jen Gunderson. If you could state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Before I start, can I just say something really quick about the rule? Aren't, aren't there rules that masks should be worn at this meeting? Point of order. Um, yes, I started the meeting by requesting and letting them know that there is mask available at the back of the room. Right, but no one is wearing, those people are not wearing them. And had I known that masks weren't going to be enforced, I would have testified via Zoom. It's not, it's not right to not follow the rules. I'm sorry to put you in a difficult position. I, I'm just pointing out the fact that people are not following the rules. Point, point of order. Point of order. Uh, 
Madam President. Can we can we get a test of your testimony? Sure. And I, I hear you and I thank you. And after your testimony, um, I would like a moment um, and to speak with the administration. Thank you. Um, so I am just here to talk about transparency. Um, I understand that I'm not allowed to discuss COVID or masking or anything like that. So that's not what this is about. But um, I watched the work session last night because I really wanted to understand um, where the district administration was, what their reasoning behind um, the potential change in protocol for COVID mitigation. And I expected an in-depth conversation with um, transparency. I thought the entire point of the meeting for the work session was for board members to gather and analyze information, consult experts, clarify problems and have an honest discussion about the potential change in protocol. Um, discussing the COVID yes. protocol, because that is on the vote for tonight, okay. that is an agenda item. Okay. Um, and so discussing transparency is fine, yes. but discussing that particularly. Got it. I'm, I'm so I'm moving on. Yes. I'm, Thank like, you. Moving on. Okay. But my point is, is that, um, I felt like specific board members' questions were shut down rather than encouraged. And I feel that if we want to thoroughly examine an issue, that questions are a good thing. And Ms. Marathi was asked by the board president to limit her work session questions and to rather send these questions to the administration in an email, and then to have the administration respond to the entire board in an email, but this, excludes the public from the entire process, which is exactly why school board work sessions are supposed to be held in a public forum, which is my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I understand that no one likes conflict and it makes us uncomfortable, but your job as board members is to find a way to work through problems, have crucial conversations here in a public forum in order for there to be accountability. Thank you. Questions by the board? Uh, Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering if you were aware of the limitations on the board regarding the Open Meetings Act. Um, I'm not, I thought that there had to be, I, I don't think I know those rules. Do you want to tell me? Um, well, I'd just like to clarify that last night our agenda um, regarding the item in question which was um, COVID update, was publicly noticed that the administration will provide a COVID update, including a review of the district's mitigation plan, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So the public was not noticed that we were going to elaborately debate masks or no masks yesterday. And but we thought, are required I... to operate in, just like you said, with transparency in public, um, and that this board did not notice the public that we would debate the mask issue yesterday. So we uh, acted within the law, and that is why we chose to move on. But That's why I, I asked for us to move on. Okay, can I just follow up, please? Um, on that, though, like, I understand that it wasn't supposed to be a debate, rather information gathering is that what a work session is is information gathering and consulting with experts which is what i believe what ms marati was trying to do was trying to get information in order for you all to be able to discuss it uh mr doran thank you ms gunderson for your testimony tonight um just so i understand and on the transparency issue one of the things that uh, in line with Open Meetings Act and our discussions are to be in the public. Um, and that information that as we move forward with different work sessions that we've remained cognizant of trying to make sure information is shared publicly uh, is, is the point that you want yeah. me, for instance, to, to keep in mind as yes, we move thank forward. You. That's yeah. what thank you. Any other questions by the board? All right, thank you. 
Uh, next, Kim Lee. And I don't see her online. Oh, I apologize. Uh, can I take a, can we take a two minute recess? Oh yeah, absolutely. I called the meeting after we scheduled for later today. Mm -hmm. Just need some more for the original one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's all in the business. It's done, but we should just assume that there's some extra work on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
know that we are a very divided community. I know that people are upset, people are scared, um, and there is a lot that people feel very passionate um, going forward. I am asking, here's the deal. We have a lot to do tonight, and I'm asking for us to I'm asking for us to be able to have a point of order in this room so that we can move forward and do what we need to do with our school district and hear what you have to say through your testimony so that we can hear what's happening so we can move forward and continue to do the work that needs to be done in this district. I hear you, I see you, and I would like to hear you at the microphone. And I don't want this to be stopped. And I am asking at this moment in time to please allow us to do this meeting so that we can make the vote that needs to be done tonight and do the business that needs to be done tonight and continue to move, move forward. Is that something I am asking? Would you be willing to put on a mask so that we can do this meeting? Okay, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask for a five minute recess. Again, absolutely again.
Uh, may I address the public in attendance? Yes. I think that the public understands that I'm not a person who supports the mask mandate. But you see that I'm sitting here with a mask. And for a while, I didn't wear the mask. And then um, someone that I respect asked me to. And the reason that I am sitting here doing that is in unity with the children and the staff who I mandated to wear a mask. And at this time, all of us in the room who most likely are not wearing a mask are here to address the board to try to win rights for our students. And our students most likely spent the day at school in a mask. And I am just going to respectfully request at this time that we stand in unity with our students and wear a mask. And that's your right, but I would like the the business of the board to proceed, and that is really our goal here. That is not my understanding. I am just asking everyone to stand in unity with our students who wore masks for eight hours so that we can get our goal with our students, which is to address this topic. Okay. I would I would really like to proceed with the meeting. But we Okay, I here's can we please be respectful? Okay. What I, I'm, I'm asking you to please be respectful so I can talk about what we will be doing. I respect everybody in this room. Okay. I respect everybody's rights. And I understand that there's a point that is being made here as we move forward. The last testimony uh, is Ron Metzner. If you'll please come up to the microphone. 
State your name, spell your last name, give us the area of residence, and you have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Ron Metzner. Um, that's Ronald Metzner, Ronald C. Metzner, M-E-T-Z-N-E-R. I live at 5001 Haystack Drive, Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm a teacher of Earth and Space Science at Lathrop High School. My recommendation is to keep the in-school mask mandate in place. Uh, um, I'm sorry, but we can't talk about that. Uh, oh, I'm signed up for. I thought I was on the. Put me on the other list. I, I thought I was talking about that. Okay, let me let me move on. Thank you. My mistake. President Luke, we also had on that list um, Kim Lee, and she is online. Uh, we will have testimony by Kim Lee. If you'll state your name, spell your last name, and give us the area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Yes, hello? Can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, my name's Kim Lee. I'm a resident of the Fairbanks North Harbor area in the Aurora subdivision. My testimony is a question. Um, as you're well aware of, the enrollment since 2003 in the Fairbanks North Harbor has dropped by 25%. Our children who are not graduating high school has increased from last year by uh, 50%. What do you feel like that you, is that you can do to change this pattern? Okay. I have unenrolled my student from the Fairbanks North Star Borough because the quality of education is not where we would like it to be. But we feel that our students are being harmed by the policies that were instituted by the previous group of school board regulators and now, with this new group, we're getting more of the same. So what I'm telling you is your quality of education is not increasing because of what your decisions are. And you, you're going to get more people, like my family, who are taking their kids out of your school district and you'll continue losing funding until there's nobody left to educate because of the decisions you're making. I feel like there needs to be a change, and a change of attitude, and a change of leadership and I know you guys just got elected to your positions and you need to think about what you want this school year to look like do you want more of the same where everybody's abandoning chip or do you want a quality of education for our children I would prefer a quality education but if I don't feel like I can get that there then I will continue to remove my children from your school district thank you any questions from the board Seeing none, we will move on to the Borough Assembly Report. Core value, engage with students, family, staff, and community to support, support student success. Mindy O'Neill, Borough Assembly Presiding Officer, will provide the Assembly Report. Good evening, Madam President and members of the school board. It's a pleasure being with you this evening. Um, so I'm here to give a Borough Assembly update. Starting with, uh, we after the first election, we reorganized the assembly. And so you will see a couple of new faces here um, uh, providing updates for you. Uh, myself as the presiding officer, Kristen Kelly, and we'll join uh, Tammy Wilson and Aaron Lajeski as the deputy presiding officer. Our uh, last meeting we had, we um, amended and defeated the GARS uh, Gaffney Airport Richardson Steese Highway project. And that sounds confusing because it is a little bit, uh, but what we did was amended it and 
uh, we're allowed to defeat it, which essentially means that there is no action taken by the local body that the state can move forward with the project. And so we will see um, support from DOT and uh, lots of information about how that intersection is going to be much improved for safety and process. Let's see here. Uh, we approved the Pioneer Park Plan. And if you haven't had a chance to um, look at that plan, I would encourage you to go to the borough website and check out a really great video that was made in the planning process. Um, the, there are several phases to the Pioneer Park plan and it is uh, quite exciting and a great place for uh, economic development for our community, great place for families, uh, children, uh, um, and visitors like to enjoy. So uh, really encourage you to check that out. There's some, some really neat stuff that's coming out of, of that, that plan. We also, uh, so coming up on this week's agenda, we have capital projects for Pioneer Park restrooms and uh, the Groudon Park, uh, some updates for the Groudon Park. So um, that's the, the really sometimes cool part of uh, the assembly is we get to update and make recommendations on bathrooms and bleachers. So um, that's what's before us next week. Um, our next meeting is January 6th. And I would just like to extend my thanks to all of you who are serving on the board and leading this community. I know one thing that I've learned in the last year uh, as being presiding officer myself and serving uh, for the borough assembly is that making consistent decisions and giving the public the right to know well ahead of time what is, is expected of them and, and what we're doing in our community really, really helps everybody uh, be able to handle what's coming up next. So uh, there's no easy jobs here and um, certainly appreciate the work that you're doing in your leadership. Back to you. Any questions from the board? Listen. Um, I just wanted to know what the GARS, um, what that project is gonna look like. Are we discussing roundabouts? lights what are we discussing there and um the plans for pioneer park what's that cost and what will be the cost to the community for that sure so the the gars project is a um there's no roundabouts but there is a an intersection um redo essentially and there is a really great video on the dot website that uh, will show you exactly how those things go um, and, uh, uh, so I would encourage you to check that out. Happy to send that over to the borough or to, uh, the board. Hey, quick that. Sorry. Um, and Pioneer Park. So, um, this is part of our capital improvements, uh, plan. And at this point, I'll, um, we're still in the planning phase. So, uh, there may be some, there may be some, uh, dollar value that is attached to it. I don't have that off the top of my head, but certainly happy to provide that at a later time. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Um, O'Neill, we really appreciate you coming in and uh, updating us with borough information. Thanks everyone. Uh, next item of business, President Report. Uh, goals and objective, ensure students, staff, families, and community are informed, connected, and engaged with the district. Um, one of the things that um, I'm just continually reminding people of is um, the uh, facility utilization report is out. Um, we discussed it last night in our um, work session. A uh, survey went out today. Um, we will be making the final decision February 1st. So last night was just informational. There's a listening session coming up, um, the survey. We have two work sessions in January. 
to ensure or a work session and a board meeting to ensure that the community is involved in this process um, so that we can um, present a sol solid plan moving forward. Uh, this is really to enhance the educational experience for our students. Um, other than that, I wanted to be able to focus on what our business is at hand. Um, and so it was just a quick, short um, president's report for me tonight. Next item of business is the chief school administrator report. Uh, thank you, President Luke. Oh, sorry. Let me just oh. finish real quick. Sorry. Um, goal and objective is to ensure students, staff, family, and the community are informed, connected, and engaged with the district. Chief School Administrator Ms. Maline will provide her report, including updates on transportation, the budget, and the status of the facility utilization task force. Mrs. Maline. Thank you. Sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit there. Um, so um, I'll, re I'll begin my report remarks this evening about um, transportation situation. Uh, Durham did hold a listening session on November 30th at 6 o'clock in this room and uh, via Zoom. Uh, they communicated their confidence and the continued uh, additional routes over the next several months. Uh, they also expressed um, a great deal of optimism in the number of applications that they continue to get. Uh, they, they mentioned that this is not necessarily the trend that they see across the country. Uh, so, so they continue to be very optimistic. They have uh, trained um, trainers, Alaska trainers from their ranks. So th uh, that is hopefully going to speed up the process of moving those applicants through the pipeline. Um, the, the budget talks within the, um, within the district uh, are beginning and continuing to happen as we look for ways to um, to balance our budget and address the shortfall. So those conversations are happening right now. As uh, Ms. Luke um, mentioned earlier, the task force has completed their work. The report is out. The board did um, hear the, the initial report last night. Um, there is a live, right as we speak, a live um, feedback form that you can participate in this process by giving your feedback on December 15th at six o'clock in Herring Auditorium, there will be an informational community informational meeting. Um, you can attend in person at Herring Auditorium, or you can choose to attend uh, via a virtual uh, space through our YouTube channel. So there will be several opportunities through this process for you to to engage and give your input um, one is is through the initial uh, feedback form and then there will be other forums uh, for you to to um, participate in this process so uh, we um, as a district we are continuing to work our covid mitigation plan which includes using all tools available to us uh, to ensure that we're using them when, where, and how we need. Um, masking is a tool. Vaccination is a tool. Uh, distancing is a tool. Ventilation is a tool. And we are accessing everything uh, that we have at our disposal, disposal to make sure that we maintain in-person learning. I would like to close my comments today with some of the highlights that are happening across our district and uh, some things that I've been uh, I've become aware of. Um, a former Hutch student, Rodney Evans, who went through uh, the Hutch um, uh, pathway of the video production, recently served as a production assistant on um, a piece, a 60 second spot uh, on MTV that celebrates Native American Heritage Month. Uh, the spot's been released now, and it's been airing on all MTV entertainment channels. Um, and so if you get a chance to, uh, to visit that work, it's, it's very nicely done. Um, I also recently had the opportunity to attend the North Star Ballet production, school production of The Nutcracker. Um, it was... Uh, 
it was a, a very exciting event to watch younger students piling into the Herring Auditorium to watch their friends and teachers dance in the Nutcracker, Nutcracker Suite. Our, um, we have three teachers, Fairbanks North Star Borough School District teachers who donated their time and energy to this production. Katie Baird, Meg Baird, and Cheryl Sanders all danced in the Nutcracker. There were two little girls sitting behind me at the production. And when uh, the first dancers came out, they gasped and said, it's a ballerina. So the excitement in the room was real. The opportunity that these students had that they may not have otherwise had was made available through a partnership with North Star Ballet. We also had right here in this room uh, on December 1st, We the People. And We the People is a, uh, a national, nationally recognized program that helps students understand the history and principles of constitutional government. Uh, it focuses on the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and fosters civic competence responsibility among students. And one of the reasons that I found this particular event uh, so inspiring was first of all, the knowledge that our students have of the Constitution and their rights as citizens, but also the responsibility that comes with that uh, the civic responsibility that comes with that um, as citizens of a country in this country and our constitution. And now more than ever, ever it's um, important for our citizens to understand the responsibility that comes with living in a country um, that is free, has a constitution that lines out what those freedoms are, as well as those responsibilities. So uh, congratulations to those uh, folks that participated in We the People and for the knowledge that they'll carry now for, with them for the rest of their lives. And that, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you so much, um, Mrs. Moline. <clears throat> Next item of business, action items, unfinished, unfinished business. One, reevaluate mask requirement to maintain consistent in person learning. Core value, safe environment, provide a safe learning environment. The district continues and will continue to utilize its mitigation plan and its resources to maintain in person learning and reduce the spread of the coronavirus through schools. With the district's mitigation plan, increased testing capabilities, the availability of vaccines for children ages 5 to 11 availability for approximately eight weeks prior to the beginning of the third quarter for students on January 4th, 2022, and community cases on the decrease. The administration is unanimously re recommending masks be optional starting third quarter with schools on military installations following command directives. As this is an operational decision, individual charter school academy policy committees uh, will make the decision regarding masking for their individual charter school as has been the case since the beginning of the pandemic. Can I get a motion? Move to make masks optional at every district facility under authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Second. Mr. Doran. Could we have a report, repeat of the exact wording of that since that's a little different than what was noticed? I just want to make sure I have the correct wording. Thank you, no problem. Um, the, it is different from the recommended motion, but I just want to remind everyone that we're not required to move the recommended motion. That's fine. I move yep, to make wording. mask optional at every district facility operating under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. And Ms. Tuttle has a copy of this motion already. 
Ms. Tuttle, can everyone get a copy of that motion, please? Point of order. Uh, yes, Mr. Dorn. Uh, just for informational purposes, I believe it should be worth noting that this is a effectively a substitute motion. Uh, I, I'm fine with the process of doing the motion, but I, for the public's interest to note. Uh, I think it should be noted that it's a substitute motion since one was uh, advertised and noticed, and this is a substitute to that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Doran. Um, could we have a report from administration, please? Yes, thank you. Um, so, as um, are you I, actually, Ms. Moline? Um, why don't we go to testimony first, Perfect. and then we'll go to administration. First, we have Lori Campbell. If you will give your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. She's online. Ms. Campbell, can you hear us? I believe so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I want to thank the school board for um, hosting this this evening and for everyone um, on both sides to keep an open mind um, and to really look at what's best for our children. Okay, with that, uh, my name is Lori Campbell, last name C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. And I live in Fairbanks and um, happily attend Denali Elementary School, or my children do, um, which is a great school. Okay, if you're ready. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm a mom with a previously immunocompromised son. I say previously because I fought to heal his immune system and put him into remission. I still am afraid every day that we could suffer a setback, but I researched and worked hard to keep his immune system healthy. It's funny that three years ago, doctors all advised me against quarantining my child. We had to allow exposure to germs to build a healthy immune system. I was told by the school that they couldn't let me know when someone was sick in class because it violated policy. I couldn't even get common sense cleaning measures implemented in my son's first grade classroom. And here we are now. How I wish the school could have helped me, that the doctors would have helped me. But in the end, I'm very grateful for the help I didn't get. Our family learned how to navigate health without the aid of people who should have been there for us. I learned that my family's health is my, our responsibility, not the government's and certainly not the school's. Last night, I listened to the board and Dr. Nace discuss the COVID school policy and the objections to removing the mask mandate. What struck me was there was little discussion on the children. It was all about the community. As we decide whether we unmask our children, I ask the school board to define their jobs. Is it your job to protect our children's education or is it your job to protect the community as a whole? I would argue it is your job to focus on our children's needs and to allow the community of adults to manage their own protection. Last night, one of your board members was disappointed there wasn't someone from risk management and legal to discuss masking. I, however, am disappointed there isn't an expert from child psychology, early childhood development, or even mental health to discuss the negatives of masking. We've been so obsessed with preventing COVID that we failed to see that we will never defeat COVID. We will implement policies that may prevent a few cases in the community, but completely overlook the long-term deficits to masking our children. There have been studies that children aren't super spreaders. That's we have too many you, time. Okay, I'm almost done. Please. Thank we have so seen much. few deaths in we children. Your testimony. My testimony, I just have another few minutes or a few seconds. 
So my question is, why are we masking children Ms. to prevent new cases of community spread? Ms. What Campbell. is the acceptable? No, let we, me finish. What is know, the accept? I want to. This is a question. To to it. What is the acceptable amount of transmission we allow? Ms. Please let me finish. Um, we we are trying to stick. We are trying to stick to the two minute time frame so that we can hear as much testimony as possible. I want to hear from as many people, and so I'm trying to respect the time frame so we can keep moving forward. We only have an hour to hear testimony. Is she still there? Do we have any questions from the board? Second testimony, um, Mike Galinas. If you'll please come up, say your name, spell your last name, and you will have two minutes. Oh, and give your area of residence. Okay, so my name is Michael Galinas, G E L I N A S, uh, Fairbanks, primary spot of residency. Um, I have some questions for you guys regarding my daughter's uh, mask and the way that this whole policy has affected her. <clears throat> Excuse me. In general, she's been basically bullied by her teacher, and now I'm learning that it's other faculty members as well at her school. Um, I have had several meetings with uh, board members or uh, district members and HR people, the principal, the teacher. I'm looking for some answers, and basically for the last month and a half, I've gotten the runaround. It didn't take that long for there to be a universal or a, a unanimous decision to take the mask off of my daughter. So what gives? If you guys have a zero tolerance policy on bullying, it shouldn't matter whether they're a student or a faculty member. I mean, that's just common sense. Next thing is she's wore a mask the entire time because it was policy. She's been following policy and when I get time after time after time told oh well we're going to go by this cdc guideline that's april 2020 well it's not april 2020 anymore oh it's not april 2020 anymore so why are we still using outdated mandates guidelines as far as i am concerned it's the parents who have the final say in opinion matters not the school board if this is an opinion matter, whether your kid should be masked or not masked. If you want to mask your kid, go for it. I don't. And I don't think that I should be forced to because you want my kid to wear a mask. It's not how it works. It's never how it has worked. So what's going to happen as far as all of these issues that I'm having with the school? I've tried to contact and I've talked to at least two board members and tried to talk to Ms. Carol Malin. Uh, Mr. Galinas, that's time. Thank you so much. Are there questions from the board? Ms. Sanderson. You said you had some situations at your school and is this, this is the first time this board has heard about it? Uh, that should be incorrect. I sent you guys an email. Uh, this is not the first time that the school board has heard about this. This isn't the first time the school district has heard about this. And this isn't the first time the teacher or principal have heard about this. Um, on a handful of uh, seven times I've been in here in person trying to figure out what's going on. And I have been met with zero conflict resolution. I waited a week to get three sentences and a link to a CDC guideline. I think that's uh, a little far reaching on the getting back to someone as far as, you know, an issue this big. And what schools your your child go to? Ann Wayne. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you so much, Mr. Galinas, for coming and testifying. Next on the list is Ginger McKenzie. If you we
Um, if you will say your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Yeah, it's Ginger McKenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. Did you say area? Fairbanks. Okay. Um, I don't speak up for myself very often. I'm tired of being quiet. I'm tired of being bullied. This fall, I heard Miss Moretti lecture about masks. She shared about immune comp compromised members of her family. And while I truly feel for her, I have the same in my family. Um, when she recommended that we were to mask children as young as two, I knew that her decisions were based on personal fear and it, those were not in the best interests of my children. Masks are disruptive to learning and communicating in classrooms. The infection survival rates for children between the ages of zero to 19, as listed on the CDC website, is 99.997%. Why are we masking our children? While long-term harm to kids and from masking is potentially enormous, several recent Ivy League studies link the following health conditions to mask wearing. Shortness of breath, inflammation, chronic stress, immunosuppression, hypoxia, vascular disease, insomnia, fatigue, anxiety, depression, compromised cognitive performance, and premature mortality. You know what that means? AKA suicide, which increased in this age group by 334% since COVID began. According to the CDC, CDC a single Varon of SARS-CoV-2 is 0.1 microns. The pore size in a surgical mask is 200 to 1,000 times that size. Wearing a mask to prevent catching COVID is like throwing sand at a chain link fence and hoping it will stop it. Masks have never been recommended to stop the spread of influenza A, B, or previous coronavirus outbreaks. Evidence shows that cloth masks increase flu-linked illnesses as virus particles become trapped in the mask. Masks raise carbon dioxide levels in the blood and lower children's oxygen levels, which suppresses the immune system. As Nelson Mandela famously said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. By that standard, our society now has the soul of an abusive parent. Now that we know what we know about masks effectiveness, let's end this conversation and this ridiculousness about mask mandates, keep our kids in school. Excuse me, she had much more time than I did. Keep our kids in school with their peers and give our children and their parents the she right. She was being asked to, questions. No, she wasn't. To decide if mask you just is the right health decision. I would ask for their. Family. I would ask you to stop, please. She was given time because she was being asked questions. Ma'am, when she first came up here, she said, "Could I please say something before her time even started?" So I, I beg to disagree with you. <laughs> questions. Next person, Kelly Nash. If you would state your name, spell your last name, area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Kelly Nash, NASH, Fairbanks. I want to first thank everyone sitting on the board because I know this has been really difficult, especially when you have to go along with people that it's so divided. I actually had something else written out, but um, I have other things I'm going to say now. According to the CDC, as of today, 93% of Americans have natural or vaccinated immunity. Um, they're, all of Biden mandates have been blocked. So your mask mandate has zero power here at all. Every mandate has been blocked. So any power you think you have to keep our kids masked goes out. Everybody online, if you guys send your kids to school without masks, do it. They cannot do anything. They can't kick your kids out of school. They can't yell at your kids. Just stop. Send your kids to school without masks on. They can't tackle all of us. Question from the board. Next person, Rebecca McGuire. If you will state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. My name is Rebecca McGuire, M-C-G-U-I-R-E. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska. I've lived here my whole life. And I have three children in the schools here. I'm testifying in support of masking. Masking is an extremely effective way to keep our kids safe. Last year when the school opened with masking, we did an excellent job with keeping kids safe and in school. This year, we opened without masking and cases in both the schools and the town 
were increasing exponentially. When the mask mandate was reinstated, cases declined, and a lot of people such as myself sent their kids back to school. The district's own level one layer of protection to maintain learning is masks and vaccines. We now have vaccines available for all school aged children. However, vaccination rates are only 2% for younger children, far below what they need to be. And despite having vaccination at the top of the school district strategy for COVID mitigation, the school district has done nothing to improve vaccination rates. There hasn't been any pop-up vaccine clinics, no emails informing us about where we can vaccinate our kids, no information about the importance of vaccines, how they work, how safe they are, nothing. I've gotten congratulatory emails about a couple of bus routes coming back and other emails that say absolutely nothing of importance. Additionally, the school district does not do contract contact tracing because the district doesn't have the capability and this won't change if masking is removed. Also, they won't quarantine children that are ill or suspected. Both contact tracing and quarantining are the standard for schools without masks. Teachers aren't even necessarily informed if a child in their class tests positive. Masking is not forever. I don't want my kids to wear a mask forever. I'm not planning to wear one forever. We have the tools now to slow the pandemic if only we can work together and not shout and scream at each other. When That's vaccination, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Any questions, uh, Ms. Smith? Thank you for your testimony. Um, I was wondering if you listened to the work session last night and the presentation that Dr. Nace gave regarding um, the mass clinics for young children. Nope, I didn't. Okay, uh, just for your information uh, and the information of anyone else who was wondering, Dr. Nace did state in our work session that parents and the community is uh, feel more comfortable in the clinic setting and making an appointment with their doctor to provide their young children with the vaccine and that there were no mass pop-up clinics anywhere in the community being offered for young children. I know. So that I would say is why the school is not hosting um, giant pop-up clinics. Dr. Nace said that that is not the way that parents are going to be receiving. Can I have an additional question to that? Yes. What if the school district sent a question, um, email out just saying that that's what you're doing and that if you talk to your provider or look at the um, a certain website, you know where to go? Uh, Mr. Rhodes. Um, my question is, uh, I'm a student, and so uh, contact tracing, um, I didn't, I'm informing you if that's improper, let me know. Um, uh, contact tra tracing at the beginning of the year was in fact implemented and done. Um, and so uh, I'm just asking if you knew that. I know. Okay. It isn't going on now though. Um, that's because the masks quote unquote fixed it. So that's, okay. that's the thinking there. All right, yeah. thank you. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next person, Caroline Brown, if you'll come up. She's online. Uh, online. Ms. Brown, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. If you will state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. My name is Caroline Brown. That's B-R-O-W-N. I live in Fairbanks. My focus here tonight is on stability and safety. This crystallized for me when I talked to my 12-year-old about the administration's recommendation and he exclaimed, don't they realize how much better it got in our classrooms when they voted for masks? We finally had everyone there. Yes, this pandemic has been going on for a long time and we are all tired, but we've been masking in schools for about three months, not forever. And according to my kids, those three months were infinitely preferable to the 11 months they spent out of school in remote learning. I fear we are headed back to that chaos if we get rid of masks at this moment, right after a time when we're likely to see a spike in cases and transmission levels in Alaska are still two and a half times higher than acceptable. And although I can read a scientific study as well as the next person, I am not a medical doctor. 
And as a result, I look to the advice of both my local doctors and national medical community. And I respectfully request that the board postpone this vote and reevaluate at the end of the third quarter. I would like to close by extending my heartfelt thanks to all the teachers and staff who have been the boots on the ground during this whole pandemic. Teachers have endured a lot of criticism over the past months, even years, but from figuring out how to deal with remote platforms to doing everything they can to provide stability in the classroom, all while teaching, they deserve all of our respect and gratitude. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for the work that you do in tackling this extremely tough issue under very hard circumstances. Thank you. Questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next person is Jen Gunderson. Are they in the room? Um, if you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. Yeah, I'm Jen Gunderson, G-U-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E and do you want to say where I live? Is that what you said? Oh, just area of residence. Oh. If you're in the north. I'm in Fairbanks, yeah. sorry. Um, okay. Uh, before the mass mandate, our schools were really chaotic feeling. Hundreds of students were quarantined regularly. Students who were out quarantining had no online access to keep up with their schoolwork. Families were told that testing was one of the district's best mitigation tools, yet tests ran out in a few weeks. Substitute teachers were hard to come by. 85% of the district's teachers said they would prefer universal masking and were ignored. Consequently, many teachers quit. Our school administration was willfully and embarrassingly unprepared. After universal masking was impl implemented, everything began to stabilize. Kids stayed in school. Suddenly, we were able to get substitutes. More students returned to the classroom. We as a community worked hard to create stability for students and staff. Despite the clear evidence that universal masking has provided stability and safety to students and staff, I find it incredibly baffling that the administration would want to go back to optional masking. Even more baffling, the district will not be providing any contact tracing. So if contact tracing isn't happening, there will be no quarantines. So yes, the school district will be technically keeping kids in school, but doing so in a non-transparent, dangerous, and socially irresponsible way. I understand that we are tired of this pandemic. I can't wait for the day when kids can safely go to school without masks, but the pandemic isn't over and we can't pretend it is and hope for the best. Our children, teachers, and community deserve better. Questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Sampson. Thank you, President Luke. Ms. Gunderson, thank you for your testimony today. Um, you mentioned that many teachers quit the district. That's um, news to me. Can you tell me how many teachers quit the district? I don't have those numbers. Do you know if uh, more than one teacher quit the district? I do know. You do? Yeah. Do you want me to say their names? No, I was just wondering, you said many teachers, and so I was, I... I know was, of a me. number of teachers that have quit okay. because of the lack of masking in schools. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rhodes. Um, you stated that it's socially unresponsible and dangerous of us to not require masks. Can you uh, provide reasoning to that? No, no. I think I don't think I need to defend my testimony or my position. This is what I said. Just leave it at that. People, okay. No, the thing is, is that people shouldn't come up here. Okay. People shouldn't be able to come up here and testify and feel like they're going to be interrogated because their views are different. It feels like interrogation. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Next testimony, uh, Nicole Eisman. If you're in here, if you would state your name, spell your last name and give us your area of residence and you'll have two minutes. Nicole Eisman, E-I-S-E-M-A-N, Fairbanks. 
core value, strive to provide a safe learning environment. I'd like to believe that all of us in this room want to keep our students in school and learning. Fairbanksans are by and large reasonable people, concerned not with divisive national talking points, but with what is best for our community. Toward that end, I'm seeking a medically informed, data-driven path forward regarding universal masking. As many of us heard from Dr. Nace at last night's work session, a layered approach to COVID prevention continues to be advised by the CDC. Masks are an essential part of this layered approach. It's important to mention data-driven advice from experts. This administration seeks and heeds advice from experts in all manners of fields, from structural engineers when we're talking about repairing roofs, to reading specialists when we're interested in improving student outcomes. We do not turn to conspiracy theorists for advice or to radio personalities seeking to sow chaos while they reap financial rewards. Yes, COVID numbers are down in Fairbanks schools and in the community at large. But I imagine that you, like me, remember life here in Fairbanks in September and October. COVID numbers were soaring. Our hospitals were at a crisis standard of care. And if you happened to cut yourself while splitting wood, there was an endless wait at both the ER and urgent care. Numbers are down now. We're breathing a sigh of relief. We're all getting out and about. I also went to the Nutcracker and would like to note that all the dancers were masked. Now we know that numbers are going to pick up again following holiday and travel. Looking at national and international maps, we can see that there's another wave of infection heading our way. Additionally, we have the unknowns associated with the Omicron variant. Our staff and students deserve the safety and stability of universal masking. We are short staffed and subs are virtually non-existent. For the safety and continued learning of our children, please continue universal masking at least through third quarter. That's time, thank you. Um, any questions from the board? Ms. Matheson. This question is actually for um, Ms. McDaniels. Are subs non-existent? <clears throat> Point of order. Oh. Really, the question should be to the person giving testimony, well, the testimony um, so we can move ahead. The testimony is that subs are non-existent. What I need to know is, so that everyone knows, is if it is if that statement is true. Uh, Ms. Matheson, can you hold that question? I should say like, virtually non-existent. just want to clarify that. When it's time questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, and truly thank you for all your work. Uh, next testimony, Barbara Haney. Ms. Haney, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Not really. It sounds real um, muted. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, let's see if I can take myself off. Barbara Haney, are you available? Are you there? It looks like she went offline. Okay, we will move on. And if she comes back on, if you'll let me know. Uh, next person is Brandy Hardy. Ms. Harding, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Um, um, if you'll State your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you'll have two minutes. Yes, my name is Brandy Hardy, uh, H-A-R-T-Y, and I'm a resident of Fairbanks. I had a different testimony prepared, but after watching this meeting so far, I have no choice but to address the negligence of continuing this meeting. Ms. Luke, you were made the president of this board. That means that you have to make tough decisions to uphold district policies, policies you yourself made. As Mr. Doran has often said, we follow rules because we never know when we'll be on the other side of them. Leaders do not seek out conflicts, but they don't shy away from them when they are necessary. Your actions tonight have shown every student watching that rules do not need to be followed. That if a rule breaker is contentious enough, then the rules only apply to some. That you can bully your way into getting what you want and doing what you want. You are allowing audience members to actively call out and bully other audience members during the break and applaud during the meeting. You are allowing by continuing this meeting, but audience members disregard district policies. 
You have made this meeting a safe place for some, but not for all. What precedent are you willing to set tonight? On the point of universal masking, removing the charters, charters and base schools options to make their choice on masks is absolutely not what any of the charters want. Both my children attend a charter school in this district and we appreciate making our own choices about that. I am also a sub in this district who has been called almost daily, far more than I can actually sub. If masks are made optional, I will no longer feel comfortable pitching in and being able to help when I can. That's all. Question from the board. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Hardy. Do we have Ms. Haney? Were we able to get her back? Ms. Haney, can you hear us now? Hi, yes. Can you uh, hear me? Okay, all right. I'll keep my testimony pretty short. I know you guys, uh, you guys have had a long night. My name is Barbara Haney, H-A-N-E-Y, and I live in the North Pole area, more or less. It's a North Pole mailing address, but I'm not in the city. I'm out in, off Nordale Road. So, at any rate, um, I emailed you guys. Um, I really hope that you uh, give serious consideration to lifting the mask mandate. I know a lot of people are into data-driven decisions, and I agree with that, by the way. And the newest study out of Denmark in the Annals of Internal Medicine with 4,000 participants concluded, our results suggest, by, this, by the way, is a random clinical trial random with you know the highest standard. This is the gold standard of research. Our results suggest that the recommendation to wear a surgical mask when outside the home among others, did not reduce, did not reduce at conventional levels of statistical significance the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Did she just uh, disappear? Okay. Yes, she did. Uh, thank you. Uh, next person is Jennifer and last name A R S E N. E A U, yes, and she's online. Just a second. If you will, oh. Jennifer, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. If you'll just state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you have two minutes. Thank you. It's Jennifer Arsenault, as you spelled A R S E N E A U. I live in Fairbanks. Uh, I'm here speaking to urge you to continue universal masking in our schools at this time. Uh, current conditions do not warrant a change of course and doing so could lead to instability. Our community is facing high rates of transmission and vaccination rates, particularly in children, are not high enough to support lifting masking in the near future. Even the earliest children to get vaccinated in Fairbanks will just be reaching full vaccinated status around the end of December. Many have yet to do so at all. Only about 2% of the youngest children are vaccinated and many families have children under five in their ho homes. As a parent of two elementary children, I worry for their health, as well as that of their peers and school staff. I also worry about more days out following exposures to unmasked peers and the disruption and worry these episodes cause. I'm concerned about the district's ability to absorb such disruptions when they directly affect our teachers and staff who are already squeezed. As a manager, I'm concerned about the yo-yo effect of staff being out with exposed kids. Following masking being put in place this year, we eliminated a lot of this that was occurring at the beginning of the academic year. Further, I work with community volunteers who serve children through field trip experiences. These community members see several district classes in person each week. Some have expressed concern about the new year with decisions about their ability to continue to participate hinging on district direction. Without them, these experiences for our students would be in jeopardy. The district's plan says level one is prevention. Mrs. Meline, mentioned that tonight, that prevention, uh, the district uses a layered variety of strategies to help prevent COVID-19 transmission. With the elimination of close contact tracing and quarantine requirements, little or no physical distancing and low vaccination rates, it's imperative to maintain masking at this juncture. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. The next 
person on the testimony list is Jim Genoso. Mr. Genoso, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'd like to first thank the uh, board for uh, wearing their masks. I appreciate you respecting everybody's side. Good evening, my name is James Genoso, spelled J-A-N-O-S-O, -S and I'm Fairbanks, Alaska, Esther area. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm the parent of a third grader and a business owner here in Fairbanks. I'm requesting that you vote to keep the universal mask requirement schools for the near future. In the advent of the new Omicron variant of COVID and the lack of critical scientific data on its possible impact throughout all levels of our community, I feel it is prudent to extend the current mask protocol until there is significant consensus in both the scientific and federal agencies to warrant consideration of discontinuing it. As Alaskans, we are all prepared or all used to being prepared for the worst, but hoping for the best. Omicron has the potential to be significant. Let us prepare and hope that it's actually only a mild storm. Political sides should not play into these types of decisions in my opinion. Out here, life and death plays out just driving to work every day on our snowy roads. Last night, I listened to the school board work session and the superintendent asked what would be done to mitigate COVID spread within the schools if masks were removed. She referred to the mitigation plan and the tools available saying they would be used appropriately. I feel that the quickest, least expensive option we have right now to mitigate the current and potential future COVID situations are already in use and already integrated, and that is masks. Also, I recall the superintendent said that if masks were removed, that there would be no contract tracing. This is poor management of a critical situation in my experience. Frankly, I feel that there is some endangerment involved when our children can take home to our community members what may be potentially life-threatening. And while experts are ardently recommending just the opposite and continuing to mask. By protecting our children, I think we are also protecting those in our community. As we know, our children come home, visit grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles, and they are a good vector for all types of illnesses. So therefore I feel by protecting our children that and is those around. That is okay. time. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you Do we time. have questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The next, the next testimony will be from Casey Cassor. Mrs. Luke. Oh, sorry. Aurora J A N Genoso. If you'll give us your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence. Can you hear me? I can. My name is Aurora Genoso. You spell Genoso, J-A-N-O-S-O. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska. I am nine years old and in third grade at Barnett. I started school there in September. I was homeschooled before with IDEA. I really, really love doing to going to regular school. I love being with my friends and art and music class. I want to say to the school board that I don't understand why the grown-ups are making such a big deal out of kids having to wear masks in school. Almost no none of the kids in my class mind wearing masks, wearing them that much. I it doesn't bother me and it doesn't get in my way very often. I want to keep being able to go to school. I don't want to get sick. I, and I don't want to make others in my class sick. Even if kids don't get very sick from COVID too often, elderly people do. I'm afraid someone will make my grandma and grandpa sick. What if I got sick at school and made an older person sick like our lunch lady there they could die i hope the rule of wearing masks stays because i 
think it is important for everyone to be safe. And it's why I don't mind my mask that much. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the board? Thank you so much for your testimony, Aurora. Uh, next testimony is from Casey Casor. Ms. Casor, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, and if you could just uh, say your name, spell it, your last name, give us your area of residence. Thank you so much. My name is Casey Casort, C-A-S-O-R-T. I'm a lifelong Fairbankson and I'm testifying on behalf of myself. I graduated from West Valley High School in 2017 and from UAF in 2020. I'm really proud to have grown up in our school district and I can hardly imagine how challenging my school years would have been if I'd been enduring years of a deadly pandemic on top of the stress of growing up so my heart goes out to all those students, staff, teachers, and parents who continue to make school amazing, even amidst all this hardship. I wanted to testify in support of the existing mask mandate or urge the board to either retain this policy as is or wait and reconsider it until the spring semester. I judged West Valley's We the People Constitution competition this past week, and I was so impressed with how knowledgeable and well-spoken the teams were. Their knowledge of the US and Alaska constitutions was amazing, but I was also proud of how these students from across the political spectrum wore their masks without a complaint or even a nose hanging out. After the competition, several of the students reached out to me because they're really worried that if the mask policy is lifted, cases will spike like they did before and they'll be forced to attend school only virtually, which is such a burden on teachers and caregivers, not to mention the students. Unfortunately, since this board is hearing this issue right now, so many students are gearing up for finals and some of the students who reached out to me with their worries aren't able to testify tonight. And that's why I felt like I needed to speak up. I know many folks have strong feelings about this issue, but I hope we can listen to the students who just wanna stay in their classrooms and to whom masking is a minor inconvenience compared to shifting their entire lives back online again. Additionally, I'm especially worried about lifting the mask policy as we face so many unknowns with a new variant in the US. And while Fairbanks remains in the highest red zone as categorized by the state of Alaska with over 200 cases per 100,000 last week. Now's not the time to reconsider this policy, and I really urge you to table this until a later date when cases are lower and kids can speak on their own behalf. And I'd also urge you to enforce your own policy in the school board chambers just to protect everyone who's there to uh, speak tonight. Thank you. That's time. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Next person is Tamara Cross uh, Rosellas. Uh, if you'll come up, state your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence, please. And then you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Tamara Cruz Rosellas, R-O-S-E-L-I-U-S, -E Fairbanks, Alaska. I have heard no specific school data supporting a change in masking. Where are the numbers, COVID cases and absences from schools pre versus post masking? The district uses data for all decisions. Why not safety? This is a safety medical decision you're making. Dr. Nays last night said taking away mitigation strategies will take away students and staff that can attend schools. She said, use all the tools you're able and come up with a plan that will keep kids in school and healthy. The district's plan does neither. She said, all studies show benefit of masking and universal masking can negate the need for shutdowns. The 2% vaccine rate of grade schools needs time to catch up to other rates. A layered approach protects learning, but what the district gave you is nothing. Most astounding was hearing the district admit to a double fail. The necessary protocol without masks is contact tracing and quarantine. Dr. Nace informed us seven days of quarantine is necessary if a close contact and no masking. But the district said they do not have the capacity to contact trace. And since it doesn't serve their purpose, they will do neither tracing nor quarantine. Where is the safety? Where is the plan? And finally, last night, the district acknowledged holiday travel will affect COVID numbers. Without masks, classrooms are only as healthy as the sickest kids. Kids are vectors, and our community is still in the red zone. 
That is incontrovertible. The board's responsibility is safety, and the district gave you nothing but magical thinking for stability, for your job in keeping kids safe in schools. Please, until the district actually has a multi-layered plan, or we're out of the red, or we're at 90% herd immunity, please keep layers in place, including masks. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brandon Burnett. Oh, if you'll state your name, spell your last name, and give us your area of residence, and you'll have two minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Brandon Burnett, last name B-U-R-N-E-T-T, -T. live here in Fairbanks. We, the parents of Alaska's children, do not want mask mandates. I'm a fifth generation Alaskan with deep family roots in Fairbanks. I'm here today to speak on behalf of hundreds of parents in our community and ask the school board to remove the mask mandate for our precious children. I have three school age children enrolled in this school district and they have the right to breathe without being forced to wear a mask. My oldest son has asthma and struggles to breathe in a mask. Public school is supposed to be a learning environment for every child in the district. I do not believe that you guys have even have the legal authority to do this, but that's not a topic for this venue. I want to thank the school board for all the time and effort that they spend on this and every other issue that we face. It cannot be an easy task, and I'm sure that many factors make it even harder these days. I don't feel the need to present data, numbers, or statistics to you because most of the other speakers will, and because I know all of you have already done your due diligence and are well aware of the truth. The science is inconclusive, and experts on both sides of this issue have vastly different findings in the studies that they conduct. But the one constant that I see across every study is that the benefits of masking children are much smaller than the overall negative aspects of continuing to force masking. Please do the right thing tonight and uh, allow my children to come back to school. Homeschool is fun, but we appreciate our teachers and look forward to joining friends next semester. Parents, the time to stand up for our children is right now. I'll end with a quote from Albert Einstein. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you. Uh, next is Joanna Levaldis. If you'll state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence. Joanna Livaday, it's L I V A U D A I S, um, Ielson Air Force Base. Um, being from Anchorage, I am generally concerned for my beautiful state and the school district where my children currently attend. Although others may believe masking is essential, they are not wrong, but they are also not right. With challenging decisions ahead, we need to make sure we're putting in place things that will support all views and concerns for our community. I firmly believe that the path forward is one of choice and agency. That should be the standard as we enter almost two years of this situation. It is said among the medical community, there's assumptions that this, we will never have a post COVID-19. We see all the variants starting to pop up. The question is, what's the objective standard? When do we draw the line on what constitutes freedom of choice? It should be the decision the students and parents should make about what is best for themselves and their children. Everyone should have the right they deem essentially appropriate for themselves. You all talk about positive outcomes for the students in the district. A proactive and positive approach would be to allow the students and parents to choose whether or not to mask. Our governor had recently stated in an interview, people did what they needed to do to take care of themselves. I don't believe in mandates. Last summer, the decision was made to give the choice to the parents. 
My recommendation is to once again give the freedom of choice back to those that have had the power to choose for their children long before COVID was a thing. This is such a controversial issue, as you all are very fully aware, with decisions that, will not, that should not be taken lightly. What is about to take place among this board impacts countless families, both vocal and present here today, and those at home. Thank you. Questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Next is Iris Sutton. If you'll state your name, spell your last name, area of residence, and you'll have two minutes. My name is Iris Sutton, S-U-T-T-O-N, and I live in Fairbanks. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all of you for being here um, and for your vote in September to mandate masking. Mandating masks gave me peace of mind sending three kids in my house to school. Um, I really appreciate um, the consistency of school this year. I really appreciate the in-person learning. It has um, benefited all three of them. Um, so um, last week when we were driving to school on the radio, we heard that the school board, they announced that the school board was considering um, removing the mask mandate. And my daughter, who's in sixth grade, who listens to everything, um, was appalled. She said, mom, does that mean they're gonna stop masking in school? And I said, that's what they're trying to do. And she was um, extremely disappointed. Um, it has come up in conversations multiple times. Um, we, it has inspired conversations at the dinner table and all three kids have a unanimous belief that masking has kept them safe this year and that they um, haven't been sick and haven't had to miss school because of the masking mandate. Um, I really would like um, them to continue to go to school for the rest of the year. Um, I think that a percentage of the students in the borough should be vaccinated before a mask mandate is removed or um, or a certain level of COVID is not in our community. Um, I think there should be clear guidelines as to when that is. You know, if 50% of the students are vaccinated, then removing masks is great. I really would love to not have to wear a mask as well. I get that, I understand that. Um, but right now we are not, we are not there. Um, only, if only 2% of the kids are vaccinated, COVID will spread very quickly in schools. And once again, they won't be able to go to school. That's just the way it is. Um, so um, there was a, a lot of people have been quoting people and there's a very simple quote that I think most of us know, um, do what you can with what you have, where you are. It's time. And that's by Theodore. That's what we can do. Questions? Thank you. Next, Barbara Tyndall. State your name, spell your last name and you'll have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Barbara Tyndall, T-Y-N-D-A-L-L. -L. I live in North Paul. Thank you for allowing me to testify tonight regarding the mask mandate imposed by this board last summer, last year, last September. I've spent a great deal of time comparing the publications and science concerning masks and the COVID-19, and based on the science I have already sent you, I'm convinced that masks do nothing to stop the spread of COVID. The following are direct quotes from mask studies. Before the COVID-19 emergency, there was no doubt healthy people should not wear surgical or dust face masks or respirators to protect themselves from the viruses of cold and flu. Previously, universal masking of all members of the population was not needed and considered generally counterproductive as face masks and respirators did not prevent viral transmission. Evidence from the randomized control trials never suggested face masks had a substantial effect on the transmission of influenza. Comparison of COVID-19 cases and fatalities of countries adopting different face mask mandates also did not support generalized face mask mandates. If we compare the countries of West Europe, which did not mandate face masks, for example, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, to other countries such as the UK, Ireland, Belgium, Germany, or the Netherlands that adopted generalized face masking policies, there's no increase in the number of cases or the number of fatalities. Masks do not substantially help, but do a great deal of harm. They cut off oxygen supply, cause respiratory infections, cause cavities and skin disorders. They isolate children and cause anxiety. 
Learning and concentration becomes difficult and for some debilitating. Please bring the smiles and the conversations back to our classrooms. Let our kids talk and laugh and breathe freely and our teachers too. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions by the board? No, thank you for your testimony. Christine Robbins. I don't see her online. Okay. Let me know if she pops up. Ms. Robbins, if, if you're online, would you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Oh, hang on just a second. Nope, it went down. Nope. Okay, uh, next is Wendy Demir. Uh, if you will just state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you will have two minutes. That was pretty close. <laughs> Wendy Demers, D E M E R S, Fairbanks. I am both a parent of two children in the school district, 10 and 14 years old, and a teacher. This is my 21st year of teaching. In all of my years of teaching, last year and this year have by far been the most challenging for many reasons. One of the largest challenges this year has been, my, been lar the large ability ranges we are seeing in each classroom. Some students have thrived academically throughout this pandemic, while others who were prior to the pandemic, a bit behind, have, haven't made any gains during the pandemic, so now they are much further behind than they were two years ago. We all know that the best way for students to learn is to keep them in school. We know from medical experts like Dr. Nace and the CDC that the best way to prevent the spread of COVID in the classroom setting is to have universal masking. We finally have our students back in the classroom, which is allowing us to teach the students with consistency and make progress. We still have a lot of ground to make up. Lastly, our teachers across the district are feeling the strain of trying to meet the needs of all of their students. Many classroom sizes are larger than normal, 29 kindergartners to, to a room, more than 35 students in a middle school science class. This means that social distancing is physically impossible. This means that our layered approach, there is no contact tracing happening anymore. This means that our layered approach to prevention and the spread of the spread of COVID is testing and masking. If we take masking away, there are no layers. We become reactive instead of proactive. Please leave the mask mandate in place. The statement, no child has died, is a sad way to think we are safe. This should be our long-term goal. No child should die, so let us continue to keep everyone safe by masking in school. In the words of my 14-year-old daughter. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next person is Julie Hagelin. Ms. Hagelin, can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, go ahead. My name is Julie Hagelin, H-A-G-E-L-I-N, and I'm in Fairbanks. Um, President Luke and board members, we're all tired of masks, but universal masking is a small inconvenience to ensure that all children can continue benefiting from in-person uninterrupted learning, and we achieve a faster community and economic recovery. Our household includes a student and a 98-year-old grandmother. We worry about the life-altering outcome that our student would be forced to live with if he inadvertently brought the virus home from school. Now, we could keep our kid at home, but you as educators emphasize that the best option for all students is uninterrupted in-person learning, and he is absolutely thriving in high school. The district's maintaining in-person learning document shows mass and vaccine vaccines as the top methods of preventing disease. These reduce spread proactively before there's a problem. Low vaccination and high COVID rates continue in Fairbanks. And despite declines, our cases remain at more than double the highest state alert level. We're in the red and there's now a more contagious variant that we know little about. This means it's too soon to let our guard down. 
And studies show that COVID transmission declines most when all kids wear masks rather than just some. So why would we make masks, the simplest, most highly recommended tools of health experts, optional now? More spread and less masking would not only be lethal at our house, it leads to learning interruptions and school shutdowns. So I ask you to keep mandatory masking in place through the second semester or until state medical professionals advise it's safe, safe to stop. Let's use all the district's best tools to protect all students and maintain learning. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Tiffany, is it Pfizer? Uh, Pfizer. Pfizer, yeah, if you'll state your name, uh, spell your last name, give us your area of residence and you have two minutes. Um, yes, my name is uh, Tiffany Pfizer, last name P-I-S-E-R, and I live in North Pole. I'd like to thank all of you for revisiting this issue. I've been a resident of the interior for 25 years. I'm an IELTSing graduate and I have six children, three of which are current students in the school district. I'm giving my public comment today to encourage the board to vote to remove the mask requirement. In addition to the reasons that were stated in the agenda item details available online, uh, namely the availability of the vaccine, there are a couple additional reasons that I'd like to point out, which have already been pointed out, but in Alaska, we've had zero deaths among children ages zero to 19, and the hospitalization rate in that age group is relatively low. The mask mandate is also putting undue financial strain on charter schools. The charter schools follow the district's lead on their operational decisions. On October 25th, I received an email newsletter from my children's school reminding parents to send in masks for their children because they were using disposable masks at a rate that they, quote, cannot sustain, unquote. Children forget, lose, accidentally throw away their reusable masks. This is to be expected. But this is an additional operational cost that our district and our charter schools shouldn't have to shoulder because masks should be nothing more than optional. Children don't need masks. It should be a decision made by the parents. If parents are worried about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they can opt for masks vaccination or both. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony. Dara Carpenter. <clears throat> Hello. Carpenter. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> um, your name, your last name, area of residence in two minutes. Uh, my name is Dara Carpenter, C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. And I live in Fairbanks. Um, I just wanted to speak on behalf of myself and people that are in the same situation as myself. Um, I currently am on leave. I am a teacher for the district and um, and a mother of four now and uh, a, a very big person to volunteer in the community. And I was made to uh, be on leave when you guys chose to implement the masks um, due to the fact that I do have a doctor's um, exemption for me not to be willing or not to be able to wear a mask. Um, and so I've been on leave since then. And it has caused a strain on my family and financial situations. My kids do not like wearing the mask. They chose to stay in school when it was implemented because they really enjoy their classrooms and their teachers and things like that. So I did take that into consideration with my kids um, and their choice of what they wanted to do. Cause I did give them the choice to stay home with mom and they chose to stay in school, which I was very proud for my kids to do that. So it was very awesome. Um, but with me, I have had childhood cancer. I am 25 years cancer free. Um, I do not get sick very often. When I had cancer, I did have my lungs be compromised. Um, so wearing that mask is very hard for me uh, with my restricted lung breathing. Um, and, but I, I am for the choice for parents to put a mask on their child. So I do not believe that we should have the masks, but I do um, 
I don't want to force the board to, to vote one way or the other. The only thing that I am asking for tonight is that if you vote to keep the masks there, to please make sure that you guys um, make sure that it's clear on your expectations of mask exemptions for staff and students. Um, That's time. Thank you so much. Um, Dara, do we have any questions from the board? No questions. And Ms. Tuttle, I believe that is time for testimony. It is. Ms. Robbins is on now. She was on or signed up earlier. Let's close with that one last testimony. Ms. Robbins, can you hear us? Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. If you'll just uh, state your name, spell your last name, give us your area of residence, and you'll have two minutes. Sure, Christine Robbins, R-O-B-B-I-N-S, out near Fox. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify, um, especially about such an important subject. Um, it's important always that rights aren't violated. Um, I do think it's ridiculous that people resort to impugning the character of another because the other side isn't submitting to unjust and unscientific policy regarding their personal health and that of the of the most vulnerable amongst us, which is children. Um, I want to address perhaps um, what physical harm can come from wearing it. And as you've heard, those with respiratory diseases are put in severe distress because they can't get enough air. I am one such person. Masks that exacerbate breathing problems. Kids faint all the time due to lack of air, as do adults. Kids and adults develop pleurisy because of the conditions that masks create. Mask wearing can lead to increased levels of carbon dioxide in the blood due to airway resistance. Ireland's Department of Health stated that it will not require masks for children for these reasons. Those with myopia have difficulty with seeing due to fogging of their glasses. Those with hearing problems cannot properly understand what's being said. Being able to lip read is fundamental to learning to, to speak for the hearing and hard of hearing. This will put the hard of hearing on a dangerous projectile in their development. It causes severe acne. Kids are distracted by the discomfort that a mask can give them. And the masks themselves can and do and will harbor dangerous pathogens. <clears throat> they also cause psychological harm. I have witnessed personally many kids just screaming to not have to put on their masks to go in a store or in school begging their parents and it is the saddest thing you could ever witness so you know we have an increased rate of suicide amongst the youth and I think with all these things that it's Miss Robbins that's time oh, okay thanks so much thank you do you have any questions from the board Thank you so much for all of your testimonies. All right, thank you. Um, I will turn the time over to administration to speak on this um, action item. Um, Ms. Yes. Ling. Uh, thank you, Ms. Luke. Um, a couple of things I would like to really emphasize and uh, encourage folks to read the mitigation plan and understand it fully. Um, Nowhere in the mitigation plan do we get rid of masks. Masks are a part of the mitigation plan. They, um, they are going, have been used, will be used as one of our mitigation tools. Um, that it is a part of a layered mitigation tool that when needed, where needed, and how needed, um, our plan implements a masking expectation. That happens, uh, again, in the mitigation plan. It outlines um, when and how that will happen. Um, so I, I just want to make it really clear that masking will remain as a tool. It will also remain as an option for all staff and students and parents to choose that for their family. So I just want to make sure that's really clear that it will remain an option and it will remain a tool in, uh, in our plan. Um, I would also like to uh, address the concern about um, the mayhem. 
um, as from the beginning of the year, uh, our testing opportunities have more than tripled in the district. Uh, we have a much uh, cleaner and actually uh, timely testing process. Um, I'll, I'll pause here. Do we need to recognize questions or should I keep going? Um, before we move to questions, um, I want to go ahead and give Mrs. Smith the opportunity to speak to her motion. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So continue. Or uh, yeah, continue right now and then you can go ahead. And then once you're done speaking, we'll go ahead and um, give it to Mrs. Smith. So Mr. Dorn, if you will hold on to your question. I'll go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So, so um, with that, I would like to clarify that the district has three new testing options since the beginning of the year in the universal masking mandate. Uh, one here at this building in the ADC, one at West Valley High School, and one at North Pole. At these sites, all staff and students can receive both kinds of tests, both the antigen test, which serves as a surveillance test. Um, if you are concerned that you've been exposed, if you've been in an environment where the danger is greater, that antigen testing is available to you and the results are available within um, 30 to 45 minutes. The other test is available to all staff and students if uh, you are um, exhibiting any symptoms of any sort, you can come and get that test to ensure that whatever you're feeling sick of is not COVID and, uh, and you can wait to get well or realize that you have COVID and, and treat it appropriately. So our testing capabilities have more than tripled since September. Uh, we have right now in our district received in-home tests that families can use um, after coming back from travel, after being around uh, in an environment they might feel is, is not as safe. So in-home tests are here now and we will be getting more. So those are some of the uh, parts of our mitigation plan that have been in place from the beginning and we will continue to do that, I, um, for those uh, parents who've had students in classes that have gone into what we call our heightened protection protocols, uh, you know that that means an extra layer of mitigation. Um, the plan calls for masking in the heightened protection protocol since we've been universally masked. That's not, not been an issue, but we increased surveillance testing to ensure that uh, we're um, uh, breaking any kind of uh, any kind of transmission that's happening in the classroom or the school. And I would like to address the concern about the district's lack of communication on vaccines. Um, it has gone out in district newsletter. Um, it has been on our social media posts, ways that families can choose to get vaccines. So the information is out there. If there is a parent uh, who is seeking information, I would encourage them to email us, but even more importantly, reach out to um, public health or your local health care provider. They have far more information. They are the professionals that can tell you um, how, when, and where to get those vaccines. Uh, so with that, um, I'll entertain any questions, give support to the board, however is important. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Moline. Um, Mrs. Smith? Thank you. I'd like to speak to my motion. Um, some people may wonder why I did not move the recommended motion. And I could have allowed someone else the opportunity to move it and then simply move to amend it, but that would have wasted our time and I am loath to waste time. I would like to address the three points right now. First, why I do not feel it's appropriate to exclude the military schools from the decision on mask. Second, why charters may not be excluded. And third, why should we should make masks optional. Speaking to the military schools, I'm a 23 year military spouse and my son is an active duty Marine. I respect and support our troops. However, my oath is to the US and Alaska constitution, not the base commander. 
The Alaska Constitution guarantees a free public education and tasked the legislature with ensuring this. The legislature created school boards and gave the elected members local control over the policies and the responsibility for all of the students within the boundaries of that district. There are families and students who do not choose to go to a base school. We force them to attend school on base by our boundaries. These families do not consent to follow command directives. We have no right to force them into giving control of their education over to the base commanders. Second, the exception for charters is just not valid. This has been debated by this board in the past, but after being questioned again and again about why charters do whatever they want, I just needed a definitive answer. I read every document on the deed webpage regarding charter, regarding charter schools. The statute is clear about the four things that they have authority over and that any exceptions must be in their contract. Also, the deed charter school director, Donald Enoch, and I spoke and he assured me that FNSBSD has liability for and authority over every school in the district, including charters. He also reminded me that deed lists every school on its webpage and lists the school's board, the school board president of that school. Every charter school in this district has our board president listed as their board president, not their APC. We are elected to ensure the equal opportunity for the education of every student in our district, and we have authority over and liability for every school operating in our district with public funds. We would be abdicating our elected duties to an unelected body, the APC, with no public notice or input on this subject. And that is not something I'm willing to do today. If charter schools want to change their contract with us, they can request the entire contract be reviewed and the board may at that time give them authority over almost anything or nothing. That is not what we are here about today. If the decision the board makes is good enough for some students in our district, it will be good enough for all of them, charter and military included. Now, as to why I want optional masks, it was unanimously recommended by our administration and our staff assures us that this is the best way to have the most students learning in our district day to day. If this passes, families have nearly a month to decide what is right for them and to plan accordingly. The bar for some people will never stop moving. It is time to free families from the mandate. Vaccines are available and that was the bar the last time. And that bar was a new bar from the last time before that, and the time before that, and the time before that. Personal mask responsibility is the clear, equitable option. It is our job to provide an education. It is a parent's job to decide if what we are providing is safe and act accordingly. I encourage all members to vote yes. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any Ms. Marathi. I'm sorry, I think I was. Oh, I apologize. Mr. Yeah. Doran and then Ms. Marathi. Sorry, Ms. Marathi. <laughs> um, I have grave concerns regarding the, uh, the motion as made. Um, I believe there's some real ambiguity on the phrasing operating under the authority um, and that it possibly is even illegal, which would be uh, a violation of our oath of office. Um, and with that in mind, I move to amend the motion to read uh, as follows, to make mass optional starting fourth quarter with schools and military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of its academic policy committee. Second. May I speak to my motion? Yes. I put this forward because it is in keeping with the approach we have taken as a board. Uh, it does recognize progress. And though I, on one hand, would love to see masks go away yesterday. Uh, on the other hand, I don't wanna be haphazard about it. And I think, yes, our community has um, a, a, a broad perspective on this. So I wanna recognize both sides. And so that's why I'm suggesting um, 
through third quarter um, and uh, but optional fourth quarter. And the reasons are this. Um, we have a high level of cases right now. Um, it's not expected to go down dramatically. It is on a decline, but likely to be the same. We have a low vaccination rate um, and within the state, I believe we're the third lowest as a community. And we have very few school age children um, vaccinated. It's very much at the very beginning. And as of this week, you know, uh, CDC has updated and given current um, guidelines. Um, DHSS, or Alaska Department of Health and Social Services, uh, still to today says follow CDC guidelines. The Alaska Department of Education and Early Development says follow CDC guidelines. Our governor has actually given districts the opportunity to make their choice, but his agencies all say follow CDC guidelines. And our local medical advisory committee recommends following CDC guidelines, which is universal masking indoors in schools. I have read hundreds, and I really appreciate on both sides of the issue, people have sent us a lot of information. And I have read those, gone to them, tried to go to secondary resources, and we may have a healthy discussion on which way. For my analysis of looking at them, the abundance of information uh, substantiated by credible resources with multiple control groups in the group, sizable uh, subjects uh, reviewed, um, that info supports masking and the benefits of that. I also look at the implementation of the mask requirement in early September. This was followed by a significant drop in school cases of COVID and related absences due to positive uh, uh, close contact and quarantine. And we also saw fewer um, schools and classes in modified operation. So it worked, we, it benefited our kids. We want them in person, we want them consistently there. That means it also helped our parents who were able to go to work and not have to worry to stay home with their kids as much. There's a concern, I, my concerns, that we will see a case rise. We have followed a pattern where when we see surges in the lower 48, Alaska always follows those surges a little bit later, but we have them. We're coming into the holiday season, uh, winter break, we have travel, we have gatherings, lots of different things going on. We know that the Omicron um, exposure is out there. We don't know what that means yet, but I'm not ready to risk kids as we find that. We have that pattern of following the national curves. We do it the same way economically, employment, et cetera, you can do that. Medically, we're there. I am concerned that the administration plan offers no contact tracing and no quarantine expectations, both of which I realize are very time consuming, but I can't understand why we would not have those as part of our mitigation plan. At the same time with all of this, I am very optimistic. I think we'll see a growing vaccination rate. I think we will have increased knowledge of both the short and long-term effects, especially on children. I have seen very positive actions by students and staff in schools. As I visited, walked around, and actually some of the student testimony uh, resonates with me on that. 
I have watched staff make modifications for kids, whether it's for medical or for other learning visual things. They, they are working on it. I've seen them work with students. What comes to my mind is this too shall pass. And I really do feel we will get through this. And it's, we're getting closer. I see that on a regular basis. New medications coming out, the vaccinations coming, all of this, we're going to get a handle on. And actually, if you look at the, the variations that keep coming up, they have some variant differences that in some way make it very, um, gives us hope for the future. We have a pattern of success when following medical and scientific advice and progress. We watched that with polio. We watched that with diphtheria. We watched that um, with measles. We have, I feel strongly, a responsibility for student health. And as an individual sitting on this board, I have that responsibility, not just for my immediate family. What I decide what risks I take with our family, that's within our family. But we're responsible for every child in our district. And therefore, with that in mind, I make the motion. And I'll finish with the fact that I recognize the discussion on the impact on children. Thank goodness it is not as great as it is on adults. Thank goodness it is not as great in general as it is on people with immunocompromised situations. But nevertheless, there are some very multiple serious consequences. Multiple inf inflammation. There are long-term impacts on kids. There is death significant numbers in our nation of young child children. So student safety and well-being is first for me. And I'll, I'll leave it there, except I also want to note that um, we got significant um, feedback from uh, the people on the front line who are working with us every day who also support masking. So that's my statement on the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Doran. Um, <clears throat> and just a reminder, um, thank you for those who are being very, very respectful of um, people talking. Uh, just a reminder to, to allow the people who are speaking to speak. Thank you. Um, next on the list is Aaron and then, uh, excuse me, Ms. Moratti. Then we will have uh, Mrs. Smith, Mr. Uh, Sampson, and then Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, uh, President Luke, and thank you, Mr. Doran. Um, it's been shown here tonight that this is a very emotional and political topic. So I'm going to try to take those out of the decision and only go with the facts. We have received email testimony from 451 unduplicated individuals with a significant majority in favor of continuing universal masking. We have heard from eight local doctors, including Dr. Nace, that suggest maintaining universal masking in our schools at this time. We have heard from two local legal experts that suggest maintaining universal masking in our schools at this time. Our state medical officer, Dr. Ann Zink, and the Centers for Disease Control suggest masking universally in schools at this time. We have increased travel and indoor gathering coming up due to the holidays, especially outside of our community. Unlike the other big five districts in our state, this new plan does not tie universal masking to any data-driven indicators as preventative measure. It has been made clear that the suggested plan does not provide contact tracing nor required quarantine. 
And while I respect the hard work that went into this reevaluation, it was pointed out last night that the suggested removal of universal masking is not medically nor legally advised at this time. Therefore, I support Mr. Doran's amendment in order to be in line with medical, legal, national, state guidance. I also hope that by giving the district time, they can address the concerns that have been brought up by the local medical and legal experts. Thanks. Mrs. Smith. Uh, due to the fact that we have extensively discussed these matters for going on two years, I'd like to call the question on this. Second. Uh, point of order. Um, if I might, Madam President, um, that is using an accorded to Parliament procedure that is uh, stand, um, limiting discussion, and I think the public needs to hear from us, and that would be an inappropriate use of that parliamentary motion and according to parliamentary procedure. Um, we have people in the queue that have yet to speak, and I'd like to allow them the opportunity to speak on this matter tonight, since they have yet to, to speak to this particular motion. Uh, Mrs. Smith, anything else? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I was uh, to, to expedite the process. I was also going to call the question, uh, considering the president's directive, we, I don't have a problem listening to two more members uh, before the question is called. Mr. Rhodes. Well, I think that as a student, um, I'm not a full voting member of this board, so my vote's more of a procedural thing than anything. Um, so all I can give here is uh, my opinion and my thoughts and my, um, uh, and I, actually before I start that, I do have one question. Um, was testing decreased after masks were implemented or was testing, um, Decrease is the wrong word, but did the amount of testing overall go down because masks were in place and that removed things like contact tracing and eight day testing and stuff like that? And um, that's that's my question. Uh, no, actually, testing increased significantly mm -hmm. um, after, before, mm -hmm. during, and after the universal masking mm -hmm. uh, conversation. So, uh, no, it has increased okay. significantly. Okay. Okay, and then um, I'd like to uh, point out that um, I, I discuss with my teachers on a regular basis um, this issue because um, um, A, I like to talk and uh, B, it's kind of fun. Um, and there's a w wide spectrum of opinions on this. And I think that on that wide spectrum, it should be choice because, and I don't think it should be choice in fourth quarter because in the wise words, of Apollo Creed from Rocky II, um, directed to Rocky, there is no tomorrow. Um, I feel like the can on this has been kicked continually, um, trying to, you know, find some end. And country, and there isn't going to be an end. Science is going in that direction where there isn't going to be an end. We've seen it with the Delta variant. We're seeing it with the Omicron variant. Places in countries like Sweden have um, not required universal mandates, uh, masking, shutdowns. They've asked their citizens to practice common sense. And um, according to the Washington Post, which is um, a liberal media source, um, their COVID numbers have actually been inflated because of their aggressiveness in texting, testing and deaths attributed to it. And they have performed as well, if not better, in then their European counterparts have required masking. And so I think that let them choose. I mean, what is, we can all be informed. We can all make decisions for ourselves. What is the problem with choice? Are you afraid of what the people would choose? And if you're afraid of what the people would choose, why is that, why is the board afraid of that, right? You were elected by the people. 
So your choice should be motivated by what they'll choose. And if you believe that the majority of the population wants masks and will do what's right, in your opinion, then they will do what's right. If you don't believe that, why are you why are you limiting their choice? You know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Miss uh, Anderson, and then Miss Anderson. Thank you, President Luke. So after a lot of testimony and heightened concern, I'll just say this for me. I want the masking to stay in place. The reason I would vote to keep the mask in place is this just this one thing. Our students have been achieving all year long up until this point. Academically, they have been achieving. Athletically, they have been achieving. Our students have gone and they've, they've been traveling, but they have tested, they've masked, and they have performed in each of their categories, just like we the people. Those students took those, those awards, mask. Our students just went for the choir, all state, and that competition is, is such a lovely competition and our students shine. Our students in this district are doing their student duties, being a kid, being with each other, academically achieving, socially achieving. And it's if it's the one thing, like I said before, if it's just this mass that's causing that to happen. And I know there's your, I've read these reports and sometimes they do seem totally in conflict with each other. But this is what I'll just tell you. For this point in time, this mask has helped keep our kids safe, our staff safe. And I've had people say to me, okay, I don't like wearing this mask, but I haven't had a sinus infection. I haven't had a cold. I didn't take any sick days off and I'm in my classroom and my students are in person learning. That is my passion. That's the only reason I ran. I sit on this board. I gave 35 years of service to this district and to the community, students and staff. Our children are achieving. They are resilient. I, I wouldn't, I don't know about the, va the, the vaccination. I wouldn't, I don't wanna have to make a decision on that because that's, a, I believe it is a parental right to put, you're putting something in your body, something you didn't make, your husband didn't make, your family didn't make, but it's, if that's your decision to do that, that's what has to be done. But this is just a small thing that our children are achieving. They are producing. They are being students. And they're with their peers and they are functioning under these circumstances, not the best, but they're doing it, this small thing. I don't know of another thing. We, we haven't lost children that I'm aware of. I know some children that have been sick with this. But if, if we can continue our year, and I'm very concerned because we're coming up on the holidays. You're gonna go out, tickets have been bought, you're gonna mingle, and, and yeah, you're doing everything you know to do for your family, but what are you going to be exposed to? This stuff is the stuff you can see. Okay, then we come back from the holidays, we're in school, and then we get spring break, and now we're traveling again, out moving around. This is in our community, we know what the levels are. But once we move out of those things, and then we come back and we function. I just want to see and give to our students this tool of completion and finishing out strong. I also sit on the state school board and I've seen and I've read and the witness of in through application forms. It's called the June Nelson Memorial Scholarship Fund. 
where we basically looked at applications from our students from across the state of Alaska and 15 scholarships are awarded. So in the process, there's a, a summary that kids write you and tell you. And the year I sat on the committee, it was about how this pandemic has affected them. It's very eye opening when children tell you how they got solutions for themselves because we didn't give it to them. As an adult, I didn't give it to them only a little bit, but on the most part, their families couldn't always give them what they needed, but they themselves come up with the solution and they saw what they needed to do to make a change to survive mentally, socially, and academically and finish strong. And I got to see that from the state viewpoint. And it changed the way I thought about a lot of things. And lastly, this is a small thing, but it changed the way I thought. When we went Zooming, I got invited to do uh, judging and conversations with kids and do some other things. And so I said, Ms. Galloway, I know what I'm talking about. And I said, oh yeah, Ms. Anderson, I'm on the school board. And, I want to see your face. And she said, I don't, I don't make the students show their faces. So when they did show their face, all of a sudden I got this revelation that really knocked me back. I don't want to do Zoom with students. I hope we don't ever have to continue to do that. But we did it and it's kind of like you're in their personal space and I want them in school learning. And that's what we have right now. It's just this one little thing is what's making that happen. But I'm just asking you to look at what our students have achieved. You had a bunch come through here tonight, last school board meeting, two school boards meeting, we had more students. These students are showing resilience, but when we are having these conversations, they're important. Thank you for coming and sharing, and hopefully we can make a decision that's going to keep on point with the students we have in person learning and provide for them what they need academically to succeed and go on and to achieve their goals. Thank you. Move, move to extend to 10 o'clock. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Doran. Um, I saw that uh, Colonel Williamson and Colonel Surrey both have their hands up. Um, we will start with uh, Colonel Williamson and then go to Colonel Surrey. Thanks. I just wanted to add uh, a little bit of the perspective that we have here at IELTSEN and talk a little bit about some of the guidance that we're under as a military installation. So uh, we do have some guidance from the Department of Defense that, that says in areas of substantial or high community transmission, the DOD requires all service members, federal employees, on-site contractors, contract employees and visitors, regardless of vaccination status, to wear a mask in an indoor setting in installations and other facilities owned, leased, or otherwise controlled by the Department of Defense. So, uh, um, you know, I think that we all would like to get out of the masks, but right now uh, with Fairbanks North Star Borough being in the uh, the high transmission area, which is our community, uh, IELTSIN is going to be in masks for uh, until that uh, until that uh, that community transmission rate comes down uh, into the the lower moderate areas. So I, I am concerned that removing masks too early, when we're still in substantial or high uh, transmission areas, is going to expose uh, children and their families. Uh, it's going to challenge our continuity of learning and put us uh, put us back to where we were at the beginning of the year, which had an impact on our military mission because military families were home taking care of kids uh, or family members who had passed uh, COVID on. So, um, you know, based on based on the CDC uh, guidance and the Department of Defense guidance uh, right now, I, I can't support removing the mask mandate uh, in schools. Thanks. Colonel Surrey. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I second everything that Colonel Williamson said uh, verbatim. Um, 
you know, we did see a significant uh, readiness impact here at Fort Wainwright um, in the month of September. And then as, as the children massed, uh, you know, in the schools, you know, my only assumption is that it was a direct result uh, of the fact that they were masked across the board, you know, because a lot of our children here at Wainwright go to school at Ladd and Tannenau uh, and, and other schools, the high school there. Um, and so the numbers did come down substantially. Um, so I fear that, you know, uh, if we unmask that we'll see those come back up and we're going to see huge impacts in our child care services and our, and our military mission. So uh, as uh, Colonel Williamson stated, I, I support uh, continued masking until uh, the rate of transmission comes down to that modern or low in accordance with the CDC guidance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Colonel Surrey. Um, I had, uh, Mr. Sampson, he. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I moved to call the question. Okay. Uh, can we get what that motion is and what a vote on that motion would be? Mr. Dorn, make sure that I have it correct. The amendment is moved to amend to read make mass optional starting fourth quarter with schools on military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of the academic policy committee. That's correct. So a yes vote would be that you are for that motion and a no vote would be um, that you are not. You second that? Mrs. Tuttle? I'm sorry? Mrs. Tuttle, can we get the vote? Oh, certainly. Colonel Seary? Sorry, no. Mr. Rhodes? No. Colonel Williamson? No. Ms. Marotti? Yes. Mrs. Smith? No. Mr. Sampson? No. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? No. Thank you. Mr. Doran? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? No. Amendment failed. At this point, we go back to the original amendment. The original motion. The, I apologize, the original motion. Um, Mrs. Smith, can you please read the original motion one more time, please? Thank you. Move to make masks optional at every district facility under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Point of order, could we get a clarification? I think the wording was separate, different at the beginning and what was just stated, or is the written one wrong? Yes, the written one is wrong. The written one had um, an, amend uh, an amendment on there before she read it in. Will you, will you read it one more time, Mrs. Smith? Thank you. I'll just clarify that I had provided Ms. Tuttle with this in writing and then chose to change the wording before I read the wording out loud as a motion. So would you so give, the, me, give, give us again? I'm sure. sorry. I want to make sure I have the right one. I just replaced every school with district facility. Uh, so move to make mask optional at every district facility under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Um, Mr. Doran and then Mr. Uh, McKinley. Um, to the motion and what my concern is, um, it's, it's interesting district facility. Um, I think that there is a uh, real question, for instance, on charter schools. I know you addressed that in your comments. Uh, they are not district facilities, except for one 
that is in a district facility who leases it from us. Um, and so that is a lease agreement. Uh, the others are not district facilities, um, which if that's the understanding that they are not, I, I can accept that. Um, I do think that if the intention is that uh, those are included, then that is a um, uh, really opens a real legal question. Um, and I know it was reported that uh, talked to a, an administrator in um, the Juno administration. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to have a legal clarity on what is the intent of this motion, um, whose authority that is. We do not uh, have final approval or disapproval of charter schools. Mm -hmm. That is in the hands of the State Board of Education. And they have that authority. They give the authority for that. And so um, I think that uh, in the absence of a very clear cut legal opinion, that would be the understanding. And that has been in line with the understanding that we have discussed um, earlier in previous board meetings. Um, so that's my comment directly to that, but related to a question that was asked of Ms. Moline uh, about testing. Um, you gave a very succinct answer about testing. We uh, were challenged to give, do testing at the beginning of the year, am I correct? Um, and we have upped the capabilities through contract for testing. But could you put that in context of uh, students, parents' choice to get tested, but their child not being, uh, having to go through uh, quarantine because they're masked? Um, could you put that in the context? So to your question about the beginning of the year being challenged for testing, um, that is that is accurate. Um, there was a supply chain problem, getting enough testing, being able to do that. Uh, another challenge at the beginning of the year were uh, employees and staff available for testing, another challenge. So we began right away training district staff. So like here in this district office to conduct testing. Uh, then we um, entered into a contract with Beacon to do the testing and they run our testing sites here. Um, our health officials, our health support folks in the buildings, the nurses, the health aides, they do testing at this school. Uh, so um, there's, a, like I said earlier, um, surveillance testing that can be done for any kind of situation, masked, unmasked, just for, for um, controlling, surveilling, making sure that it that the virus isn't coming into or being transmitted in our schools. Um, and then, of course, we have the other type of testing that if there is symptoms, then we can identify early on what we're dealing with, COVID or not COVID. Um, so that's kind of the testing history. And, um, and that testing process would happen with or without masks where the masks come in in our heightened protection protocol is if there is a class or a school that is showing high transmission rate, then we would implement the masking tool to help break that transmission. So would you put it in the context of, because we have uh, in our community um, increased opportunities to test, students can actually return sooner they don't have to quarantine so that actually I see what, yeah right so it we has have benefited us yes benefited students in person very much so we have at some places call it a test to stay um, protocol where if there is a situation that a student may be exposed they can test on a certain intervals to to make sure that that they aren't sick or they aren't carrying the virus 
so they can continue to come to school, they can continue to do their work and interact with their peers and are tested uh, at permission of their parents. We do no testing, no kinds of anything without uh, permission of their parents. If the parents choose to not do the test protocol, then they would need to keep their student at home, but they can choose to test and stay in school. Thank you. And then my last comment at this point is just a reminder that our board norms, which is for everyone um, to assume positive intent. And uh, I just want to make that clear. I am not acting, and I don't think any board member here is acting out of fear. Um, we all are coming, I, I believe every single one of us um, elected and advisory are coming from a perspective of best interest for students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rhodes? Um, so last time when we had this vote, uh, I remember one of the things that influenced my decision was um, the vast amount of students being taken out of school, not necessarily due to amount of cases, but because of the contact tracing element. Um, and I have personal experience in this uh, element that caused this major problem for lack of student attendance because um, I played football, okay? And a football player caught COVID and anyone he was in close contact with had to be quarantined for eight days and then they could get tested on the eighth day and come back to school if they tested um, negative. And only one other student out of, I think like 20 some individuals tested positive um, after that eight days. Um, and so I think the decision, at least my understanding of the decision and was we implemented masks because we were contact tracing and the contact tracing what was was what was removing students. And so in order to eliminate contact tracing, we had masks on because then there is no contact right because that is what the CDC uh, guideline is. Um, and so my question is, um, with us not doing contact tracing, would that be a problem? Um, or my statement is, and that's more of a rhetorical question, if anything. So the, the question being contact tracing and going back to Mr. Doran's comments about um, our testing protocol, um, and, and again, sometimes it's called test to stay. So if there is a situation where there's a case in a classroom or two or three, then students would be tested. And those students that chose to, families that chose to do the testing um, would help keep the virus out of the school, um, which would eliminate the need for that quarantining or the leaving. Those who didn't would need to do the, the quarantining. And so follow up and follow up. Um, if you're they're being tested if they're exposed, but they're not being sent home. If they choose to be tested, they can stay in school. If they choose not to be tested, then they would need to go home. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Smith. And then um, Ms. Marathi and then Ms. Anderson. Thank you. I'd just like to speak to a few questions. Um, I appreciate Mr. Doran um, clarifying the district facility, and, and that may be a cause for an amendment to that motion. Still thinking on that. Um, but I would like to read directly from the Department of Education website regarding charter schools. Charter schools are public schools. A school district is liable for a charter school to the extent that it is liable for other public schools in its jurisdiction, right from D. For example, a superintendent or principal may um, suspend a student from school, but only the local school board may expel a student to include charter schools. Then I'm looking on the next page of their webpage, and when I click on any charter school in the Fairbanks North Starboro School District, it lists our school board as the school board for that school. So I will continue to argue for that and 
put forward that any charter schools who would like to operate under different um, protocols or operating procedures, then we are laying out for all of our students, they can simply come to the board and request an amendment to their contract and we can give it to them or not. And then um, I, I would like to say also regarding the charter school issue that I'm a realtor in my other life here. I'm not a realtor, actually, I'm a licensed real estate professional. I gave up my realtor status. And um, in real estate, there is a situation called encroachment. And, uh, you know, people let people encroach on their properties. They see it, they know it's happening, and they leave it there. And after time, that becomes adverse possession. And at this time, we have let the academic policy committees of our charter schools encroach on our elected responsibilities for the students in our district. And I would like to remedy that situation before it becomes adverse possession. Uh, Ms. Marotti, then Ms. Sanderson. Thank you. Um, I would like to move to postpone the universal masking decision to the February to the regular board meeting closest to the February 1st um, date uh, with to include schools on military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of its academic policy committee. Second. Uh, Ms. Tuttle. Since we have a motion currently that we're working on, are we allowed to move through that next one? Okay. Yeah, the motion to postpone would, would shut down the current motion on the floor. Got it. Yeah, I could, just for clarity, you're talking the January 18th meeting, so that's the next regular one closest. The reverse meeting. That's the one right after. Sorry, what's the one right after February 1st? Yeah. There's January 18th, February 1st, and February 15th. Oh, there's one on February 1st? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's, then, then that. Okay, let me reread it then. Would that be helpful? Uh, let's see. So, move to postpone the universal masking decision to the February 1st regular okay. school board meeting to include schools on military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of its academic policy committee. Second. Um, Ms. Sanderson, oh, did you want to speak to it? Go ahead and speak to it. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for a compromise. I think our goal is to keep kids in school and this amendment gives the district time to assess the impact that the holiday travel and gathering has had on transmission within the district and the community and more time to receive guidance about Omicron and it sets the district up for success. This amendment also honors the people on the military, uh, the people on the military installations uh, that the advisors were speaking about um, and their need to follow federal requirements on their installations. Ms. Anderson? No, I don't, you can skip me. Uh, Mr. Sampson. Uh, Madam Chairman, respectfully, I insist on calling the question. Point of order, it's the intent to shut down debate and for the public to know how we feel. Would the Madam Chair um, rule on that point of order? Uh, Mr. Sampson, we currently have uh, Mr. Doran, uh, Ms. Um, Matheson and Mr. Rhodes in the queue. I'd like to finish, oh, I apologize, and Mrs. Smith. And at that point, we will call the question, or we will we will go to the vote. 
Thank you. I, I respectfully, once again, um, oh, did you, is that your ruling? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran. Thank you. I support the motion to postpone um, because I think we do have a real legal question here. And I think it's is, uh, very important for us to know that we have a, uh, a clear legal understanding. And I understand legalities have various perspectives, and that's why you have lawyers, et cetera. Um, but that we really need that to make sure that we are taking action either way on this motion, on the main motion, um, at the time it would come forward uh, with full understanding of what it means, because it does have a tremendous impact on people. And I, and I believe that without that, we are perhaps uh, putting some school communities, which are parent choice, and that we uh, say we really want to support, um, that uh, they have an opportunity to respond to this as well. Um, and that uh, had some of those charter schools decided differently earlier in the year regarding masking, uh, I don't think this would be the question that would be there. So uh, I think we need a real, I, I would request a, in the meantime, that we get a legal opinion on the ramifications of this motion. Uh, Ms. Matheson, and then Mr. Rhodes, and then Ms. Smith. Oh, uh, Ms. Moline. Just to remind the board that, that uh, February 1st is the date scheduled to vote on the school closures, just as a piece of information as well. Thank you. So we're concerned about people traveling um, and people are scared to take off a mask, but they're willing to travel. To me, that's an oxymoron right there. Um, the legalities, I think that Ms. Smith did investigate before she brought her motion forward. So I don't think that there's any legal repercussions. Is there? If I might, we have not had a legal opinion. We're on the issue of legality, and I'd like to, uh, most of the board probably knows because we're all well informed here, um, that there are current legal issues on the use of mandates in the federal government. OSHA tried to come out with one, and that was shut down immediately. So should we be really questioning the current legality of the mandate we have and just be counting the blessings that no legal action has been made so far? Okay, Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Um, I do not support this motion. We have had enough time. It was noticed the last time we voted that we were going to be voting this time. There will always be one more variant. There will always be one more school vacation. There will always be a day off. There will always be something. I've had enough of um, constantly kicking the can, moving the bar, changing the qualifications, changing, um, uh, just not being decisive. And if the um, charter schools or the base schools for that matter, have a, um, an interest in bringing it to us that what we are asking, should this motion even pass, um, the original motion even pass, um, they have legal options before them to challenge it. And I would welcome them to do so, so that we can settle this issue. And I um, also would like to say that those schools also have a month between now and when we're asked to go back to school to make their accommodations 
and make their legal challenges. A month is plenty of time to clear the air on this situation and that we do not need more time to make the decision. We have noticed it um, for three months that we were making this vote today. Um, I am going to, um, Ms. Moline, before we go to the vote, um, is there anything that you would like to speak to um, about deed? So um, I will just say that I did talk with uh, Don Enoch, the, um, the charter school director for the state, um, and he did, uh, did tell me that charter schools operate under the umbrella of the local school board in this matter. So he did confirm that. And he did also say that if a charter school would like to do differently, then that is certainly a choice they have. And so they would come to the board and ask to amend their, um, their agreement. So he, he did, um, as, as deed interprets the statute, uh, charter schools operate under the umbrella in the area of what uh, what masking would fall into the area that he didn't see it as an operational um, decision. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, we fall under the purview of deed. Um, and so following deeds recommendation um, and deed um, guidance is uh, what we do need to follow. That's true. So school districts do operate under the uh, authority or the um, jurisdiction of the state school board. Thank you. Um, can we get what the motion is on the floor um, and what the yes or no vote would be? And Ms. Moradi, I needed clarification. Um, postpone to the February 1st regular meeting, the decision or masking? To postpone the decision regarding universal masking to the February 1st regular school board meeting, including military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of its academic policy committee. Okay. Madam President. Yes, sir. Or were you insinuating that we're going to vote before? Yes, sir. Discussion is, I have some, something to say. Go ahead. Thank you. I have yet to speak to this motion. I made a motion to call the question and it was insinuated that what I'm doing is stifling uh, people's ability to have a say in, in ability to participate in the process. I say to you that this motion does just that. We are here today, as we've noticed the community, that we are going to address this issue. We didn't say what's going to happen one way or the other. We owe it to the public, as we have stated in the past. We put it on the docket. It's in the paper. We told you all we're going to look at this. We said we're going to look at it a long time ago. It's come up today. To try and circumvent the vote tells me that we're trying to kick the can down the road. That tells me that someone doesn't want to hear what this board has to say. What the heck is wrong with taking a vote on masks, masks being optional? It's called a quorum of the board. If the board says no, it's no. If it's a yes, it's a yes. We get the opportunity to rule. That's what we're up here for. If, if I want an attorney to make all these decisions, we just have an attorney here. Alaska state statute dealing with charter schools is extremely clear. If you can read, you can understand the statute, okay? Thankfully, our superintendent made the decision to call Juno and get clarity on the subject. I had called Juno two years ago and got clarity on the subject. I didn't need to call, I can read, okay? The last superintendent didn't do that. Our superintendent has. Apparently, the statute is in line with what Juno is saying. That is, charter schools have about 
autonomy relating to four or five areas. And I can tell you what, what has been said here is true, that we aren't the final decision on charter schools. Correct. Deed is. But we have the money. It's our money. They come to us and say, hey, can we do a charter? We say, yeah, you can do a charter. And you are given the authority that's given to you by statute and no more. Doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want. So in this district, when the superintendent says, y'all ain't going kayaking on the river to watershed, they're not going kayaking. Point of order, point of order. The point? Uh, Ms. Luke, you, I, you make the decision now. Uh, yes, Mr. Sampson, I think your point was well taken. Thank you. You're, are you saying that I don't get to speak in the, okay, I challenge ruling the chair. Okay, we go to a vote. And the yes vote would be to allow Mr. Sampson to continue to talk. Nope. A no vote would be for Mr. Sampson to continue. And the yes vote um, would be that the challenge was accepted. Yeah, it supports the a yes vote supports the chair. A no vote would overrule the chair. Okay. Ms. Tuttle. Colonel Surrey. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. Yes. Thank you. Colonel Williamson. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson. No. Thank you. Mr. Doran. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Marathi. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. No. Thank you. Mr. Sampson. No. Thank you. Mrs. Luke. Yes. Thank you. Challenge uh, passed. Motion passed. The chair's decision was was upheld. Was held upheld. Okay. Can we? Um, we are going to go ahead and go to the vote. And can we get what the vote was? And um, the vote on the challenge. No, uh, I apologize. Um, we were going to vote on the motion that was on the floor. The motion to postpone. Yes, because that was already um, stated that we would go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to go ahead and vote on that. Okay. And state um, if we put if you do a yes, you are postponing the vote, and if you vote no, then you are not in favor of postponing the vote. Okay. The, the uh, motion by Ms. Moradi was postponed. The decision on masking to the February first regular meeting to include the schools on military installations following command directives and charter schools following the direction of his academic policy committee. Everything. Okay. Mr. Rhodes? No. Thank you. Colonel Williamson? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Suri? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marathi? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? No. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? No. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? No. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? No. Thank you. Motion failed. So now the motion that is on the floor Is Mrs. Smith, uh, Mrs. Smith, can you give the motion? I'd like to move to amend the motion. Sorry. I'd like to move to amend the motion to say move to make, make masks optional at every district facility and for all students and staff under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Second. Can you say that just one more time? Sure, no problem. 
move to make masks optional at every district facility and for all students and staff under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that? Uh, I appreciate Mr. Doran's um, clear, asking for clarification. And so I am simply adding the words and for all staff and students and staff to make extremely clear that I mean every single student who um, is participating in any kind of publicly funded education in the Fairbanks North Star Borough over which this elected board has authority. Mr. Doran. Um, I have two points I believe to make. One is I want to clarify that when I asked for a um, legal um, opinion on this, uh, and it is an opinion, they are given to us, we decide how we want to take that. So that needs to be understood. I was not asking for a legal opinion regarding uh, the masking question. I think that is actually relatively settled, although there are questions even our governor says we have the right to do it. Um, but I'm asking in terms of a legal um, status regarding the charter schools, I think there is fair um, interpretation and I'd like to, I would really like to formally request a legal opinion regarding the impact of this on particularly our charter schools. And I am concerned also about fair notice to the public, uh, particularly the charter school uh, community, because um, what was noticed was that their APCs would be able to make their decision. Our practice has given them the right to make that, has recognized that um, as one of their decisions and that uh, we sought some legal opinion regarding what's uh, programmatic or what's not. Um, and so uh, we have a pattern of doing that to all of a sudden um, significantly uh, impact possibly their operation and their understandings um, is uh, without notice uh, is a great concern to me. And I also want to recognize that as a board, we supported um, the fact that our charter schools were taking on some special training this year, getting some updates, and that we have said that we would, as a board and a district, both last spring and again this fall, that there were things that needed to be addressed um, and that uh, we would take the opportunity this year to address those understandings so that we are current with the charter school operations in the state. Um, and especially considering that we had some of the, we had the first uh, charter school in the state, uh, that um, we have a history. We also need to um, continue that process. And I would urge us to allow that process to happen. Uh, Mrs. Smith and then Ms. Marotti. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say that I support charters. Three of my students go to a charter school. And the charter school that my children attend um, reasonably dealt with masks over this year. So this is not about me not supporting charter schools. This is about adverse possession, as Mr. Doran has clearly stated, that we have an encroachment of authority by the APCs. We have been remiss in allowing that previously, and I'm ready to remedy. And that the charter schools have one month, which is more than enough time, to request a review of their contract and an accommodation. We have plenty of time to notice a meeting to review their contracts and have an, um, a, a meeting over the break 
or whatever needs to happen. And I will personally work to make sure that we can get a quorum and have those meetings. Um, and, and I would support that. I um, also would like to say that uh, the statements of the board to the charter schools that they have um, authority to do what they want, but also must conform to what we ask them to do is absurd. We ask the charter schools, they must come in here and give us presentations on what kind of training they're doing to, for, for their teachers, but yet they're allowed to do what they want. Um, we ask them to prove to us that they're conforming to our DEI standards and other things. We have dragged those schools in here repeatedly to just tell us what they're doing and make sure they're doing what we want. But then we are saying that they also can do what they want that this is insane and that the notice that was noticed to the public said a recommendation was the motion to exclude charter schools if we were to go to mask optional and allow their APCs to make those decisions. That doesn't mean that we noticed that we're going to consider this motion and at any time, we could have had a motion to amend the recommended motion to remove that. And then every time we have an amendment, are we going to have to re-notice our entire meeting and have another meeting because we amended our motion? Uh, the charter schools knew very clearly from our uh, notice that we were gonna discuss whether or not they were going to have that authority. It was noticed that that was going to be what we voted on and it could have been a yes and it could have been a no and i am not inclined to um deal deal with this one day after today thank you uh miss moratti uh through the chair may uh may I ask sharon in regards to the charter schools what was provided in the public notice and was it sufficient notice to make this a legal motion as far as the charters the agenda as you have it was provided online the the notice in the newspaper had just the title of the um, item which reads with the subject reevaluate mask requirement to maintain consistent and in-person learning that was in the newspaper um, as part of our one day Friday ad um, and then that was the heading of the agenda item and then the agenda item has its board note thank you um, is there anyone we can contact uh, I wish there was an attorney here um, to find out if this is a legal amendment The wording from the original motion uh, the, rec the re recommended motion um, had military installations and charter schools on there um, and basically it took off that portion of the motion so it still has the basic understanding of that motion. So it's not changing the intent of the motion to where it wasn't noticed properly. Am I correct, Mrs. Tuttle? That would be your interpretation as president. Okay. President Luke, if you could take just a five minute at ease um, for um, a message. Thank you. Five minutes.
lay it on me. Yeah, it always assumes so, yes. The Burroughs Emily.
It looks as though we have all of our board members back up dais. Um, 
Can I get a motion to extend? Move to extend to 1045. Second. All right, thank you. We are moved to continue till 1045. Um, I was able to speak with legal and I was able to get confirmation that um, my statement earlier was correct. Deed is in fact our governing um, entity within the state. And um, according to uh, Daniel McE E. Enick, who is the state correspondence charter early learning and Head Start Administrator for the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development, that based on this statute, um, issues specifically not addressed uh, within their charter, they are going to the board and that the board is the governing entity um, for charter schools within our district. Um, and before we do go further, I would like to just make a couple of statements. Um, I know that this has been a really tough time for our community, for people within our community. Um, but I want to say that um, we have a really great layered approach. Um, I spoke to a lot of people and I did a lot of research. I spoke with medical personnel in other states. Um, I spoke with other school districts. I spoke with other school district employees to see the gamut of how things looked in their district, how they looked in our district, um, going down to state statutes and learning. Um, I believe that what our administrative staff put forth with the masking being optional or a part of the mitigation plan when needed is a great layered approach. This is something that is going that has been with our community for two years um, and it will continue to be a part of our community, our daily lives. Um, and we need to learn how to weave mitigation into our daily life rather than allow it to lead our daily life. Um, one of the things that was stated was that we need to wait for vaccinations. Um, they are available for those who would like to get vaccinated. Um, we have waited um, to ensure that that is available um, over two months before the start of next semester. Um, people will have had an opportunity to get all of their children that are school aged minus the pre-K um, vaccinated. We are not saying that you are not allowed to wear a mask at school or within our buildings. If your comfort level dictates that you want to wear a mask, I implore you to please wear a mask. Um, that is your choice. If you want to get the vaccination, it is here and available. If you want to get the vaccination, I implore you to get the vaccination. Speak to your medical provider. We at the district are educators. I believe in Mrs. Moline and her ability and the executive directing staff and their ability to lead this district forward. Right now, we are talking about forward movement. Right now, we are talking about where we need to go and how we need to get there. Many of the articles that I have read, some have said, don't take masks off now. Some have said in the NPR um, that said January 1st, December 28th. Um, but I do believe, like I said, I have confidence that we will continue to move forward as a district um, with Karen Moline at its head, 
with the board constantly moving us forward. We have a lot of work to do. We are working on facility utilization. We have our budget. We have our, our um, uh, employees, our students. And the one thing I want to really focus on right now is, is our students. Um, our students are looking to us to make these decisions to move us forward. Um, and I want to thank our students for, for writing. Many students wrote. Um, and many students have reached out to me. And I want to thank you for doing that, because I know it's not easy to reach out to a member of the school board. Um, I believe that we have had ample time of everyone being able to speak to this matter. Um, and I do believe um, if we could get the motion one more time um, and say what that motion is um, and what a yes or a no vote would mean, um, and I would like to move this forward. Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Um, I believe that we would need a vote on the amendment Amen. that I have to go forward. Correct. Okay. So the motion as amended is moved to make masks optional at every district facility and for all students and staff under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. A yes would adopt this and a no would um, turn it down. Yes, it's to the amendment. Yeah, this is an amendment to the amendment, correct? Correct. So there will still be another vote before it correct. is complete. Colonel Williamson. No. Thank you. Colonel Surrey. No. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran. No. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson. No. Thank you. Ms. Marotti. No. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke. Yes. Thank you. Amendment carried. Can we get the motion on the floor now? Or able? Um, Did you move, speak to it? Were you, she already spoke to it, didn't she? Oh, go ahead. Move to make max optional February 1st. Second. Can I speak to it? Yes, please speak. Um, I feel like this is a compromise. I've been compromising all night. We have to come to a compromise that that is the safest for our community, given the travel and the indoor gathering and the unknowns of the variant coming. Um, balance that with the testimony that we've heard and the professional advice that we've received. Um, and so that being said, I feel like February 1st is the last compromise that I can make. And I hope that the board sees that and supports it. Mr. Rhodes. I would like to reiterate what has been said several times tonight. It's always something new. Um, we started off um, middle schoolers and uh, elementary schoolers couldn't get vaccinated. That was the, that was the bar. We're now here at that bar. You're trying to impose a new bar. You know, spring break happens um, in March, you know, a month after we remove masks. You know, I, I don't think that there's ever going to be a month wherein there's not going to be some sort of holiday or traveling, as has been stated. So I think giving them a month, giving them winter break, giving everyone that time to assess is enough time for them to come to the decisions they need to come to. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think everything that has been discussed has been discussed and so on and so forth. Mr. Doran. Um, I will support this because 
Um, it does give an extra month. Um, it gives two months for families to plan accordingly. And in terms of vaccination rates, um, as we learned last night at our work session, currently the uh, age five to 11 group is about two and a half percent fully vaccinated. Um, about 17% has started, another 15% another has started the process. Um, and that, um, especially given that a lot of this is happening within clinics, uh, that there is not the uh, pharmacies are not providing uh, child level uh, doses for the, uh, for the vaccine. Uh, it's limited, um, more limited access than was there. Um, and so even if families take this and, you know, whatever, the, have, depending on the result of the vote, but if this would pass um, tonight, that it gives parents the opportunity to get in line for their vaccine, get started and get fully, their child fully vaccinated before um, this mass option went into uh, effect. And I think that's something when we're talking really about um, 85% of our students who need to uh, uh, go ahead, begin that process. And the fact that even though it was approved earlier, Pfizer was approved, it was a couple of weeks later before Moderna, um, parents might have waited because they, they got Moderna, they want their children to get the same, um, that I think we really need to give them uh, fair notice month time is not much notice at all. So I support the uh, effective date of February 1. Mr. Rhodes? That 85% number um, is excluding the fact that from the age 16 and up, you've been able to get vaccinated. And um, that encompasses a large portion of the student population. Um, and so I think those who want to get vaccinated readily have the opportunity to, and those that do not are not going to. Um, and so, yeah. Could I just clarify my comment? I specifically stated the five to 11 age group. Those statistics were specific to those. It looks as though there are no more comments. Mrs. Tuttle? Mr. Rhodes? No. Thank you. Colonel Williamson? No. Thank you. Colonel Surrey? No. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? No. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? No. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? No. Thank you. Mr. Doran? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marotti? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? No. Amendment failed. We are back at the original motion. Are there any other comments about pertaining to the original motion? Mrs. Matheson. Can you read that original motion one more time? Move to make mass optional at every district facility and for all students and staff under the authority of the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education starting January 3rd, 2022. Mrs. Tuttle, it looks as though we're ready for the vote. Mr. Rhodes? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Williamson? No. Thank you. Colonel Surrey? No. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Noren? 
No. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? No. Thank you. Ms. Marotti? No. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? Yes. Main motion as amended carried. Next item of business, uh, action item, new business, resolution 2022-11, honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Core value, embody respect for the diversity and dignity of all. School board resolution 2022-11 honors Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. Uh, King Jr. and proclaims the week of January 16, 2022, as a time for teachers and students to conduct special studies of Dr. King's life and achievements and to safely engage in service activities throughout the Fairbanks North Star Borough and School District. Mrs. Sanderson, will you please read the resolution? A motion. Oh, I apologize. Can I get a motion? Move to approve resolution 2022-11 honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Second. Can we read the resolution, please? Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education Resolution 2022-11, honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Where is the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District envisions excellence and equity for all? And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also dreamed of an outstanding education for all children. And whereas Dr. King believed education transmitted the accumulated knowledge of human race, as well as the accumulated experience of social living. And whereas Dr. King dedicated his life to justice, equality and service for the greater good. Whereas the principle, oratory, and achievement of Dr. King are worthy of emulation, wherefore the third Monday in January, a national holiday since 1983, has become known has become known as a day of service, by which to honor Dr. King's legacy, and whereas a day of service empowers individuals, strengthens communities, bridges barriers creates solutions to social problems and moves us closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Fairbanks North Starboro Board of Education honors Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by proclaiming the week of January 16, 2022, as a time for teachers and students to conduct special studies of Dr. King's life, achievements, and to safely engage in service activities throughout the Fairbanks North Star Borough and School District. Mrs. Moline, would you like to speak to this? I have no comment at this time. Comments from the board? Mr. Doran? I'm going to say that I'm very, very glad to uh, be supportive of this resolution and um, would encourage if anyone has a chance, if they're in Washington, D.C., to make sure they go see the monument um, uh, to him, the memorial there. Uh, it's extremely impressive, and I'd encourage you to take time to hang around and listen to conversations. Uh, people for whom his example has made a difference in their lives, listening to um, grandparents talking to grandkids. Uh, I can tell you from personal experiences, truly um, uh, edifying and humbling to have been a part of that. I was there just shortly after it was dedicated. Um, and I am very cognizant of the uh, uh, fourth, uh, whereas there in terms of service for the greater good that I think is parcel of what we do here on the board and on other elective bodies um, throughout our community. So I'm glad to support it. Thank you, Mr. Dorn. Mrs. Tuttle? Uh, public comment. Just oh, I apologize. Is there any public comment? Seeing none. Uh, can we call the vote, please? Colonel Surrey. 
Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Williamson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marotti? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. And Mrs. Luke? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you. Number two, resolution 2022-12, honoring Black History Month. Core value, embody respect for the diversity and dignity of all. School Board Resolution 2022-12 honors Black History Month and proclaims February 2022 Black History Month and encourages staff and students to honor it during February and throughout the year with interactive research, classroom lesson plans, guest speakers, display lectures, um, practical activities, and cultural celebrations. Ms. Marotti, will you please read the resolution? Motion, President. Oh, goodness gracious, I apologize, thank you. Uh, can I get a motion? Uh, move to approve resolution 2022-12, honoring Black History Month. Second. Now, Ms. Moretti, will you please read the resolution? Fairbanks North Starboro Board of Education, resolution 2022-12, honoring Black History Month. Whereas, since 1926, our country traditionally commemorates and celebrates the contributions of African Americans during February. And, whereas, since our nation's bicentennial, in 1976, each president has issued proclamations declaring February as Black History Month, and whereas Black health and wellness is this year's national theme and acknowledges the legacy of not only Black scholars and medical practitioners in Western medicine, but also other ways of knowing, for example, midwives, doulas, naturopaths, herbalists, etc., throughout the African diaspora, and whereas African Americans have contributed significantly to the economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development of the country, as well as that in the Fairbanks North Star Borough, and whereas African Americans value knowledge and learning, and whereas students of African American heritage are significant population of the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District student body, and whereas African American teachers distinguish themselves as educators in the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District classrooms, and whereas African American principals and assistant principals have led their schools with vision, and whereas school board members of African American heritage serve with distinction, and whereas African American exempt paraprofessional and classified staff support all student learning, and whereas incorporating an accurate portrayal of African American history into the curriculum and teaching the contributions of African American history, culture, society, and language in the classroom promotes academic success for African American students, increases the understanding of all students, and benefits all citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education proclaims February 2022 Black History Month and encourages staff and students to honor it during February and throughout the year with interactive research, classroom lesson plans, guest speakers, displays, lectures, practical activities, and cultural celebrations. Thank you. Do we have any public testimony? Seeing none, Mrs. Moline, would you like to speak to this? We have nothing at this time. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Seeing none, Mrs. Tuttle? Colonel Williamson? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Surrey? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes? Uh, yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marotti? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you. Next item, uh, Resolution 2022-13, Honoring Elizabeth Paradovich Day. Core value, embody respect for the diversity and dignity of all. School Board Resolution 2022-13 proclaims February 16th, 2022, 
Elizabeth Peradovich Day and encourages staff and students to honor her historic contributions and commitment to the ideals of civil rights and non-discrimination throughout the district and on an ongoing basis. Can I get a motion? Move to approve resolution 2022-13, honoring Elizabeth Peradovich Day. Second. Mrs. Matheson, can I get you to read the resolution? Yes, ma'am. Whereas historically, Alaska Natives faced overt discrimination in housing, theaters, hotels, restaurants, and public facilities, and whereas civil rights activist Elizabeth Paratrovich, an Alaska Native of Tlingit heritage, was a leader in the civil rights movement in Alaska and worked for equal rights and freedoms for all Alaskans, and whereas Elizabeth Paratrovich, courage, vision and impassioned testimonies inspired the Alaska Territorial Legislature to pass a resolution entitled an act to provide for full and equal accommodations, facilities and privileges to all citizens and places of public accommodations within the jurisdictions of the territory of Alaska. And whereas when Governor Ernest Gruning signed the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1945 into law, on February 16, 1945, it was the first anti-discrimination bill passed in Alaska and occurred two decades prior to the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964. And whereas in 1988, the Alaska State Legislature des designated each February 16th as the annual Elizabeth Paratrovich Day in honor of her committed pursuit to overcoming discrimination in Alaska and whereas Alaska's governor annually proclaims February 16th as Elizabeth Paratrovich Day in Alaska and encourages all Alaskans to recognize and reflect upon the tremendous contributions Elizabeth Paratrovich made to Alaska and her people. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Fairbanks North Star Borough Board of Education proclaims February 16th, 2022, Elizabeth Paratrovich Day and encourages staff and students to honor her historic contributions and commitment to the ideals of civil rights and non-discrimination throughout the district and an ongoing basis. Thank you. Do we have any public testimony? Seeing none, do we have any board comments? Seeing none, Mrs. Tuttle, can we have the, the vote? First. Mr. Rhodes? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Williamson? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Surrey? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doran? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Sanderson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Marotti? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Matheson? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Luke? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you. And our last item of business, uh, information and reports. Board Budget Committee report. Goal and objective. Ensure students, staff, families, and the community are informed, connected, and engaged with the district. Andrew DeGora, Chief Operations Officer will present the Board Budget Committee's report and recommendations. Administration? So I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Mr. DeGraw. All right, thank you, Ms. Moline and Ms. Luke. The Budget Committee convened, began our work in early October and had three meetings in our initial process. We have another meeting upcoming in the during the winter after the issuance of the proposed budget. So we'll continue our work into the into the next calendar year. We started our process with Ms. Sanderson as our chairperson. I appreciate the work and effort she took over, I believe, last year at some point in the process. And I was happy and, and grateful to work with her on the committee. And then we're, we're very happy to also welcome in Ms. Matheson uh, as the chair, the current chair of our committee. So excited to work with her going forward as well. So uh, we had an initial three meeting process where we 
the committee received a lot of information, received an update from myself on our current budget situation, and then received some reports and information from various departments around the district. And we came up with a report by way of a memo that you have in your packet. I'll go through that memo. The first page, I'm not gonna read the entire first page there. It talks about the scope and function of the budget committee, re review the process, the budgeting process that we have, um, consider, uh, make sure it's a goal-driven process, the dialogue we have, ensure that the process is timely, accurate as possible, and comprehensive. Working principles, we recognize the strategic plan as the guiding document of the work of that committee. And then we want to support a, a budget process. And, and this is uh, one of the key points for me is transparency. So many, many obstacles related to budget involve a lack of transparency. So you know, which lack of transparency equals lack of trust. And then that can that can spiral in a downward manner and, and cause significant problems. So transparency is, is a big part of the process where I think it's important that we have stakeholders from various parts of our community come together, hear uh, uh, specifics of our budget situation, be able to dive into the nuts and bolts of the budget even and to have a good good understanding of how things work. So the I'll start at the bottom of page one and I'll begin reading from the from the report. The budget committee met three times during the months of October and November and discussed the overall financial position of the district. The group held in-depth conversations about the district's revenue sources, expenditures, the impacts of the global pandemic and declines in student enrollment. As part of reviewing the expenditure side of the budget, the committee received comprehensive reports from executive directors of various departments within the district. A consistent theme heard and discussed was the department's objective to maintain services to students and staff, while at the same time facing the possibility of significant budget cuts. I think that's a, that's a key line from this is the challenge is trying to maintain the most efficient, best services for students during the time of a global pandemic that's causing significant social, emotional, academic challenges, obviously at the same time that we're facing a, a, a significant financial mountain in front of us. Final meeting with approval for input occurred on November 9th, 2021. And continuing on page two, the budget committee recognizes the district is facing unprecedented financial challenges as key a key part of the committee process had members identify rank and discuss priorities or district objectives to protect to protect within the school year 2025 strategic plan in a budget cutting environment. So again, you know, there's not a lot we can add at this point, right? But what do we want to preserve? What are our priorities as a community, as staff members for students, having students in the strategic plan as a main focus point? <clears throat> Through this exercise, the committee identified student success and workforce and organizational excellence as high priorities. Other items of importance were in the areas of equity and inclusion and communications and engagement. Members think the areas identified should be preserved to the extent possible in the face of budget reductions. So then I'll continue on. The highest ranked priorities identified by committee members are as follows and student success unsurprisingly was was the focus of of much of the feedback competency based learning and i won't i won't read the entire narrative in each area i'll just go through the high points competency based learning one key point to identify here is the latter part of the narrative there the pandemic has created significant challenges to this work and the committee urges the district to utilize cares funding as one tool to address these challenges so a, a student centered focus utilizing CARES funds. The purpose of those funds is to help us as an organization to address impacts of the pandemic. And those are across the board. Academic is what we think of immediately, uh, but you, you get into the schools and the classrooms and the trenches and you realize there's many students that have challenges even prior to COVID, they have challenges just to get to a place to where they can even learn, right? And so that's become even more, those challenges have become even more acute today. And we have CARES funds and, and the committee felt it very important to use CARES funds to the best of our ability to help address those obstacles and challenges. 
regarding competency-based learning. <clears throat> Instructional excellence, the district's most important asset is its human capital, its staff, all educators, whether they're teachers or support staff. Um, very important to continue to focus on that. Multiple pathways, career CTE, the district has historically had a high focus, uh, 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 big focus on, on, on CTE and the district should continue to do that. And then social emotional learning, again, uh, an area of utilization of CARES funds to help address those challenges for students. Number two, workforce and organizational excellence of staff. And again, as I mentioned, our most valuable resource is staff, and so we want to attract and retain the best staff possible. Um, the, that this was one area that the committee, again, recognized the financial challenges we face. Not a lot to add, but the last sentence. Additionally, the committee encourages the district to consider demographic shifts and look at new ways. Oh, it's the sentence before the last. I apologize. Given the challenging hiring environment, the district should preserve or expand its recruiting efforts. So the best way for us to serve students is to have, be fully staffed. Right now, the district is facing significant challenges. The Human Resources Department is working day, evening, and night in the morning to, to attract staff the best we can. And, and potentially, we ought to look at new ways and even expand um, our, our, our recruiting efforts. Number three, workforce and organizational excellence related to facilities. The committee recommends the district consider school closures as a way to consolidate operations in light of significant enrollment declines. District-wide capacity is currently at 65% with several schools below 60%. This equates to over 5,500 empty seats across the school district. While it's possible enrollments will rebound in the future, building capacities have persisted low, at low levels for many years. There are significant fixed costs associated with maintaining school buildings which include administration, routine and long-term major maintenance and utility costs, among others. Staffing vacancies have created gaps in services available to students as the district maintains the same number of physical buildings with a significantly reduced enrollment. By reducing the number of buildings in operation, economies of scale will be gained, efficiencies will increase and students will be better served. And then number four, additional priorities effective communication and then family engagement. And here we, we, we had a significant robust dialogue in this area. It's interesting, it didn't necessarily link to the budget necessarily, but the committee had a lot of ideas and a lot of, we, we generated a lot of thought within the community that they will take out to their contacts, to the schools that they, they are, are in the schools in their communities and I think that the key point that folks were realizing was communication and effective family engagement is a direct link back to student success. Everything we talked about, all of the, all of the, the recommendations, the, the feedback points lead directly back to student success. Excellent staff, consolidating buildings to better serve students, to eliminate vacancies, to eliminate those gaps so students have a better experience family engagement, what better way to, to, to generate student success by getting parents and, and, and folks involved or grandparents, aunts and uncles, guardians. So was very pleased with the overall discussion to focus on student success, you know, as it relates to, to what we do with the budget. So, and then just to finish out the memo, the budget committee is scheduled to meet again on March 9th. Topics there will include legislative updates, lobbying and advocacy efforts, updated revenue estimates, and a review of the proposed budget. So I just want to publicly thank each member of the committee for participating this year. It's a, it's a worthwhile effort and endeavor that we set out on. Again, thanks to, to Ms. Sanderson and, and, and to Ms. Matheson for their participation and past participation and future participation. And I, I I, I appreciated the committees. It, it feels like they recognized the, the limitations that we're going to have from a financial perspective. And they, they had thoughtful input and feedback on 
what can we do with limited resources to have the highest impact on, on students? So that concludes my report and I'll stand for any questions. Move to extend to 1110. What's the current time that it, we're at? Oh, we had second. extended to 1045. So second. We don't need to fill it if we don't need the time, but. Any questions or comments for Mr. DeGraw or administration? Mr. Doran. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeGraw, for that um, review. Um, the report is uh, parallels our strategic goals and very globally. And um, I was interested in terms of the in-depth conversations uh, referenced to in the report. Um, was there discussion other than perhaps the school closure, which is a specific step, but discussions on how to, uh, where we should be looking to, um, and I'm looking for some more specificity, uh, even if in general categories, but looking at some of the number areas, affected areas, um, uh, recommendations on the revenue or expenditure side, uh, concrete ideas, suggestions that they had, or they just stayed in the very low global and we didn't get any feedback on uh, to guide us as we look at generalities in budget. Yeah, so, so on the revenue side, we talked a lot about the limitations on the district's ability to generate new revenue. On the expenditure side, we did have significant dialogue in the area of school closure, and there was there was a general consensus or a lack of opposition to this 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 feedback point on school closure. Beyond school closure, the opportunity was there for committee members to bring up ideas and thoughts on reducing expenditures. I didn't necessarily take the committee to that level intentionally, but the opportunity was there related to school closures to, to offer up and, and there weren't additional items of feedback or ideas that the committee had specifically to reducing expenditures. Can I do a follow up? Okay. So is there plans with the committee to uh, move forward when the administration budget comes forward that we'll have recommendations for for areas of cuts um, the uh, I'm, I'm looking where we're getting that community input the advantage of having an advisory committee to give us the administration and the board some guidance uh, in those areas of actual reductions or really saying you know, okay we're limited in our ability to actually um, uh, generate revenue, but we can ask and request for re revenue increases. Any conversation on that from the and recommendations from the committee? Yeah, so on the revenue side, the there wasn't necessarily a lot of dialogue, but several times when we were discussing revenue, we I do talk about the the concept of advocacy. And so we talk about advocacy at the level, the state level in Juneau, as well as the local level here with our, with our borough assembly. That is discussed. It will also become a significant topic at our March meeting, because at that point in time, our, our proposed budget will be public and a, an ask for, of the, from the district of the assembly will be public. And that would be a great opportunity to educate folks on the benefits of the local contribution, the significant contribution that is to, to our education that's made at a local level. Um, I talked I talk to the committee about, I, I do believe that education is extremely important to the Fairbanks community, all from, from one end to the other. And that, you know, given the significant challenges that we're facing, if, the board opts to to close buildings that the district will be making significant significant efforts to right its financial ship and that that there will be an opportunity there to advocate at the local level for additional dollars so yes we did talk about that and again the march meeting will be a great opportunity to 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 reinforce that narrative and to you know get folks involved stakeholders 
in all areas of the community involved in, in supporting the school district. Thank you. I would just say that uh, I would be hopeful. March is, we're well into our budget discussions um, and it would be great to get earlier feedback from the committee. Uh, I know it's hard getting a, a date, but if that was any way a possibility, but certainly no later than that March 9th that we have specificity from the committee that would have to be turned around quite quickly to and us. Are you talking on the expenditure side? Feed, additional feedback on the expenditures revenues side, and or? revenues and expenditures because we're going to be making big decisions on on staffing and to have their input um, regarding um, those staffing for student success okay we're going to have to make some adjustments in that we or we certainly anticipate that sure so. yeah uh, that's a great point i think the March 9th meeting would lend some time to give feedback on through email to the board, as well as the opportunity for public testimony at the second. Well, we might not have a second board meeting in March. Do we? We do. That's after spring break. OK, so opportunity for public testimony as well as email testimony to the board. And then on the revenue side, I will say, you know, the real advocacy would start at the borough level after April 1. So on the revenue side, there's there's significant time and opportunities to be able to advocate for for additional revenue there. Thank you. I would just say advocacy starts now. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you for very much. Any other questions from the board? Um, seeing none. Um, we can move on. Mr. DeGraw, thank you very much. Um, and thank you as well, the uh, budget committee and chairs. We appreciate the work that you do. Um, according to an email sent out, we will go ahead and, to the board. We will forego um, board comments and superintendent comments um, due to the extension of the meeting multiple times and the actual time of the night. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. We are adjourned.